Hi, I'm Andy Shalal. I'm the owner of Busboys and Poets. We are so happy to have Rock Newman and the Rock Newman Show join our tribe here. We are a tribe. This is a place where racial and cultural connections are consciously uplifted, a place where art, culture, and politics intentionally collide. This is a space to take a deliberate pause and feed your mind, body, and soul. We believe by creating such a space, we can actually change our community, change DC, and change the world for the better. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Changing the world for the better. One step, one conversation at a, at a time. If we can, we try. This is The Rock Newman Show. Today is Saturday, August the 3rd, 2013. Can you believe it's August already? Where did the time go? We are broadcasting live from the stage of the Langston Hughes Room at Busboys and Poets, 14th and V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. And let me say we are proudly doing that. Proudly doing what? Proudly broadcasting from the stage of the Langston Hughes Room at Busboys and Poets, 14th and V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. Those of you out there in uh, video land, webcast land, please Feel free to come down, join us, have some great back breakfast and great conversation. Today's show, let me run down the lineup. <clears throat> We've got an interesting one for you, as hopefully we always do. We've got Brian Yeldell in the, uh, in, at the table with me right now. He's author of Notions and Potions, and he's a documentary filmmaker. And he's doing a project called How D.C. Basketball Changed the World. Uh, in the ni at 9.40 coming up was, will be Councilman Vincent Orange Sr. Vincent has been one of the strongest proponents on the D.C. City, City Council for something very controversial as of late, and that is the living wage bill <clears throat> that has yet to be sent to Mayor Vince Gray. It is a bill that, that could potentially cause um, one... DC employees to get what is termed a living wage, and that's $12.50 an hour. The flip side of that is it could force companies like Walmart, who are coming in to uh, anchor some big projects in the city, to, uh, to flee Washington, DC. So we'll talk to uh, Council Member Orange about that and a few other things going on in Washington, DC. And uh, at 10 o'clock, we have Juan Williams. Juan is a Fox News political analyst. Um, uh, he has some very uh, interesting comments all the time. And this week, Juan said that Al Sharpton and Michael Eric Dyson were frauds and hustlers for criticizing and demonizing white folks like Bill O'Reilly. Um, so we'll talk to Juan about those comments and, uh, and some other matters. And then we have coming up, Mayor for Life, Marion Barry, councilman now for Ward 8 in the District of Columbia. And we'll be talking about Washington, D.C. with the Mayor for Life, Marion Barry, and all things Marion Barry. And then um, in our last hour, we will have Phil Fornacki. Phil is the... Uh, direct, was the director of D.C. Prisons Project, and he was with the Law Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And he just, they just came out, he co-authored a report that says that 83% of all arrests in Washington, D.C. Uh, are of African, the, 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 uh, the victims of arrest are 83% African American, and they make up, African Americans make up 91% of all drug arrests, even though now, the African-American population is less than 50%. And we'll wrap up the, the, the show today with something that just warms my heart. Um, Sally Schwartz, the founder and executive director of the D.C. Center for Global Education and Leadership, will be in studio, and she'll be accompanied by uh, a resident from the District of Columbia, a high school resident from the District of Columbia, and a high school uh, student from Japan. There is the Tomodachi Exchange Student Program between Washington, D.C. and Japan. And it is an exchange of youth where uh, Japanese students have come here and have it just um, really immersed themselves in uh, Washington, D.C. culture. 
and, and have been accompanied by uh, what students from D.C. public schools. And in November, Washington, D.C. School, school students will go to Japan. And they're working on a project where ultimately the goal of this will be to, for these kids to come up with service projects to help their communities. And the community in Japan that is being, uh, that is attempted to be helped is the area where the tsunami hit worst um, in Japan. So we're going to talk to them about their experiences, and we feel really great about today's show. Thank you for joining us. And without any further ado, let me go to Brian Yeldell. Brian Yeldell, welcome to The Rock Newman Show. Thank you very much, Rock. Brian, you are an author. You are really a consultant. You are a filmmaker. You are an entrepreneur. So we just simply don't have time to get into all of those things. But part of what I wanted to do, you have a fascinating uh, book out. Folks, the name of Brian Yeldell's book is Notions and Potions. And it is the writings and the musings of a, wa a longtime Washington, D.C. native, someone whose um, a parentage, heritage is steeped in Washington, D.C. and Washington, D.C. politics. Brian Yeldell's uncle, um, amongst many in his other family, but uh, Joseph Yeldell was certainly a powerhouse in Washington, D.C. politics for de decades. Joe Yeldell was often known as the fixer, for those of you who might not know, because if there was a problem, folks turned to Joe Yeldell to fix it. And Brian uh, is not far from the, uh, from, 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 hasn't fallen far from the tree of his uncle. So Brian, notions and potions, we could start anywhere in that book, but you make an interesting comment um, about memorable moments. You know, I just quoted a statistics, a, a statistic about how many African Americans were being arrested in the District of Columbia, and that scenario where African Americans in urban areas are overwhelmingly arrested and portrayed in really negative ways. So it strikes me, and I want to start here, in your memorable moments in uh, Notions and Potions, one of your moments that you talk about is the birth of your two daughters. Yeah. Um, I say that because it is about the next generation. Um, you know, I'm 50 now. I've done quite a bit in my life um, from, you know, growing up in southeast Washington, D.C., going off to Morehouse and eventually getting my MBA and um, working in banking. And, um, you know, I really wanted to acquire a set of skills such that I could be a CEO. Um, because I think when I look at my uncle's generation, it was about politics. And politics, the next thing is economic parity. And I wanted to pave the way for my daughters um, to show them that they could go out and take a chance in entrepreneurial life. I talked about my corporate life briefly, but I worked at IBM. I also worked at uh, uh, Bank of America. I worked at Chase Manhattan. All very good grounding, but it was time for me to go out in my, on my own. And um, one of the things I think that prompted you to, to reach out to me was my latest essay, which was called The Battle of the Brains. A person set, gets a set of skills, such as um, your left brain skills, which are analytical, but you also have to call on your right brain sometime, which is the creative part, which is why I went out into entrepreneurial life. But going back to why I, um, I am an entrepreneur is to set the stage for the next generation. And for me, that's my daughters, my younger family members. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do, though, and, and, and I make no apologies for, for, for attempting to highlight this, um, you know, s we talk about now, we hear so often on the news about the one-parent households, sure. you know, children being born out of wedlock, no father around or anything else. Um, Brian Yeldell uh, walked in with his beautiful little daughter, uh, has, t has two children. Again, in terms of a memorable moment in your book, Potions and Notions, okay. I'd like for you to go back and talk about that experience of, of fatherhood. Um, quite frankly, it's not in my book, but I wrote an essay which spawned another book, which I plan to bring out next Father's Day. It's called Bye Bye Guys Guy. Growing up, I hung out a lot, I had a lot of fun, but I had to put that life away in order to, to set an example for my daughters. So I would have to say that that particular essay is one that really 
just brings everything home as to transitioning from a single person to a married person to a person with two children and having to set an example. So it's that essay. While it's not in the book, it is definitely, um, when you said the moments, that's a moment definitely that, that comes to my mind. And it's called Bye Bye Guys Guy. Um, and I did spawn it into a, an entire book. Right now the book is going to probably be about 16 chapters, a little over 300 pages. But it's all about the transition from being a single person who kind of hung out on these streets here, right here on U Street. I remember it going from um, the 80s, which is everything was down, and then building the subway and Ben's Chili Bowl trying to have, you know, just to get a few customers. I've talked to the owners of Ben's to understand that transition and how vibrant this area is now. But I was one of those early, you know, late 20s, early 30-something yeah. people when it made that transition. But as it relates to my daughters, that life is over. It's about building something for them. And uh -huh. that, that particular essay speaks to that. And, and having lived the experience that you've lived, as you said, out there and having some fun and, you know, having to take on a much greater sense of responsibility, what would be your message, not just to young black men, but young black men and women when they contemplate having a child? Um, well, quite frankly, um, and, I, and I always, I say quite frankly because I'm more, being more emphatic opposed to being, telling a, a, a truth versus an untruth. Um, I'm, I probably wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. I thought that I could do both, but you really can't. So that would be my message to, it would be to be ready and to understand that you have to devote your time to them I find myself going to all kinds of things, having daughters. I thought I would have a, a couple of sons, and because in, I think we're going to get into the basketball piece, I love basketball. And while my daughters can appreciate basketball, if I had a little blue chipper, it would be a different thing. But now I find myself going to recitals. I find myself going to, um, you know, gymnastic events. Um, I've even had a few tea parties. And again, going back to the whole name of my book, Guy's Guy, I was a guy's guy, you know, let's go to the bar, mm -hmm. let's go to uh, football games, tailgate parties. But I've had to, you know, reach into my softer side. And one of the things, again, I make no apologies about it, too, is my growing spirituality. And I know the Lord has a sense of humor. And me being that guy's guy, he gave me two little girls to, to touch into that. Right. Um, so, you know, coming out of Moorhorse and condolences for not being able to make it at Howard University. Because you had to go down to Moorhorse. But that, that's okay. We will hold that against you today. Okay. okay. Uh, um, you know, coming through, coming through Morehouse, coming out into the corporate world, sure. um, you have gone from banking, from consulting, um, as an entrepreneur, and really started writing pieces that have insight into culture, into humanity, into spirituality. Tell us about that metamorphosis. Um. Well, uh, uh, again, going back to the MBA, an MBA kind of teaches you a, a top-down approach to business. I have an undergraduate degree in accounting. My MBA had a concentration in finance, and I started a marketing firm. I touched on all three areas of business, and I got involved with a media company. And um, one of the things that really started me writing as well is I sat there. I took my daughters down, not on the day of the inauguration in 2009, but the day before, because I thought it would be too busy. Both of those days was cold. Exactly, very cold <laughs> and very busy. But I sat there that day and watched the, the inauguration, and I, I wrote an essay that talked about the fact that um, President Obama talked about a lot of things that we needed, but a poet and a, and a minister talked about the fact that we're going to need some love, too. And I want my daughters to always think about that. So that was my first essay. Um, and then I wrote one the next week and the next week, and I literally have been writing them every, for five weeks. But another thing that started for, me... For five years. Five years, yes. excuse mm -hmm. me. Yes, for five years. Mm -hmm. So I've written close to 250 essays. Mm -hmm. And one of the essays, when I started with the media company, I wrote an essay about basketball because I really wanted to eventually do a documentary. But I also really intensified my writing because having a media company, and while I do some of the business development for it, I also wanted to show people who had ideas if they wanted to come in, they had an in-house writer who could write their story. Because typically, and the name of the book was, was, was created because the, the title of the essay is The Notion. The body of the essay is The Potion. And I really, again, thinking about President Obama, I wanted to help in my way to solve some of the problems that I knew he would face. Because if we all remember where the economy was, 
and, and the fact that a lot of the um, Congress and, and, and not so much the Senate, but Congress wasn't getting along. So in my own little way, and in my own little world, my little, if you will, Washington, D.C., Morehouse community, UVA community, my fraternity community, um, shout out to Psi Chapter, um, Morehouse College, Omega Psi Phi, um, all of those communities, I mm -hmm. wanted to be able to touch those people and be able to, um, to have some words of, of uplift and also kind of continue the message of sometimes healing. Yeah, and what's been, what's been the response? What kind of feedback have you gotten? Uh, folks, I am going to um, give this book a plug, not because I have any interest other than trying to help make the world a better place one conversation at a time, but you know, this is not a highly heralded book, something that you see on the New York seller best time list yet, but I'm going to strongly encourage you, get this book, Notions and Potions. It is a powerful, very interesting, compelling, uh, compelling read. Thank you very much, Rock. Um, what was your question again? I'm sorry, I got caught up in, in you patting my back. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no problem at all. No, my, my point was about the feedback that you oh, got. Oh, sure. Yeah, well, quite frankly, I found that when I first started writing them, um, I got a lot of people writing me back. Oh, that was a good essay. Um, one of my essays is called Why We Love a Train Wreck. And I found that the world, you know, when everything's nice, they don't mention it. When there's a train wreck, it just, you know, people hop on it. And so right now, I write an essay every week. I have close to 4,000, or a little over 4,000 people on my distribution list. And when it's a hot, fairly controversial topic, I may get 120 responses. Uh, when it's kind of benign or innocent, um, I don't, you know, people just say, hey, but when I see people in the street who yeah. are on my distribution list, mm -hmm. um, so I get a lot of positive feedback. I mean, every now and then, and it's funny, I go out literally and I collect them one at a time. Sure. Um, and again, I started with a po approximately 300, maybe 500, because I used to be a promoter. And so I had a fair amount of people on my list, but it has grown from, you know, January of, of 2009 yeah. to 4,000 4, people. Okay, we're going to take a quick break here on the Rock Newman Show. Come back, and man, I can't wait to get into <laughs> how Washington, D.C. basketball changed the world Absolutely. on the Rock Newman Show with Brian Yeldell. This is Leprechaun Tim Pohanka from Pohanka Nissan and Pohanka Hyundai. It's hard to be down on your luck when you're Virginia's first choice for new Nissan and Hyundais, but I need to sell 60 cars this week. Right now, I'll pay you big bucks for your good luck. Bring down any good luck charm you've gotten based on the sale price of the car you choose. I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car this week. Today, your lucky penny is worth plenty, up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car you want. Stop moping and hoping you'll get approved. With my For the People credit approval process, the banks are looking to get lucky and lend to you, even if you've been turned down before. Bring me any good luck charm, and I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car today. Hurry, once I get rid of 60 cars, the luck runs out. All offers require bank approval, so call us at 1-800-POHANKA, visit Poanka Nissan and Poanka Hyundai on Route 1 in Fredericksburg, or better yet, log on to timpoankaforthepeople.com. And when we make a deal, I promise it'll be your lucky day. I'm Tim Poanka, and I'm a leprechaun for the people.
And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. My guest uh, today, August the 3rd, 2013. This is Saturday, by the way, for those of you who might have had too much of a good time last night to realize what today is. It is Saturday morning, and we're at the uh, Langston Hughes Room at Busboys and Ports in Washington, D.C., and my guest is Brian Yeldell. And um, we're talking, we had, uh, in the last segment, we talked about uh, uh, Brian's book, Notions and Potions. Um, and I want to transition uh, to this multifaceted gentleman here. Um, Brian has been working uh, in a collaboration to develop a documentary, uh, and it's called, uh, the, the documentary film will be called How D.C. Basketball Changed the World. Now, that is a very strong title. Um, quite just before we go into how D.C. basketball changed the world, let's kind of step back. Who's the best basketball player ever to come out of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area? Easy, Elgin Baylor. Easy. Elgin Baylor. Elgin Baylor. Mm -hmm. he, I mean, well, uh, just as a caveat, he started it, and, and no one's really – and one of the things that I think about is the fact that he took the game off the floor. Um, they want to credit that with, with Dr. J. Um, but he took the game off the floor. When the NBA wanted to spread west, they needed a, a guy who had skill and who was marketable. And Elgin was the guy. And here's the real topper for me. I see these guys doing the things that they do. And some of them may be a little bit better. A lot of them close and some of them right on par. But I played basketball for a long time, and, and I know the difference between canvas shoes and leather shoes. And if you can do it with canvas shoes <laughs> on concrete. Chuck Taylors. Chuck Taylors. <laughs> and sometimes pro kids. <laughs> certainly, I mean, that's what makes that statement so easy. You say. know what? Th that's, I'm going to say profound. <laughs> because you, you just really touched on something. You said it casually. But the National Basketball Association, uh, one of the major major league franchise, uh, 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 leagues, mm -hmm. wanted to go west. And you're, you maintain that it was an Elgin Baylor who helped the NBA to expand west, that he had a very large impact on the success of that expansion. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, when I think about, again, I've done quite a bit of study about this and you know, the game was started, and we can get into this with the, with the documentary, but we talk about a gentleman by the name of E.B. Henderson. Yes. And E.B. Henderson was in um, Massachusetts, learned the game from Naismith, came back to D.C. and wanted to play at the Y, the Young Men's Christian Association, and they wouldn't allow him. So he went to Howard, and he went to Armstrong, he went to Dunbar, and a few of the high and schools. And this is what time period? This is in the early, the turn of the century, yes. the turn mm -hmm. of the 20th century. Right. And... Um, and, and, and he was able to create a league, and he also was, he put physical education into the school system. But, um, and so the game was largely on the East Coast and some of the other inner cities, but when, you, when they went to California, which was probably more baseball areas and track and field and swimming and volleyball, they got a guy like an Elgin Baylor. And one of the things that's not talked about as well is that he averaged over 35 points and over 15 rebounds for three straight seasons. And, I mean, that's just not done now. Now, some people will argue that the, it, it was a lot less competition and maybe argue the fact that there were a lot less African-Americans playing, which means that they didn't have – it was a lot more structured game at the time. But he took – inside of that structure, he was able to do that in a very creative way. You know, it's very interesting uh, you talk about that because he played for a strict disciplinarian. Elgin Baylor played for – quick disciplinarian named Dave Brown, mm -hmm. who is an absolute legend in terms of <clears throat> his coaching skills and the men that he grew uh, during his tenure as coach and as teacher. Um, last week, I think it was, Glenn Harris was on here, and Dave Brown's name came up in, in that conversation. He was, a, he was a gentleman who never, ever raised his voice but he's carried such a very big stick and had an impact on so many. You talk about Elgin Baylor, um, and, and, and Dave Brown certainly had impact there. Also, uh, Dave Bing. Sure. Now, we, but, you know, we'll, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, when we talk about Elgin Baylor or Dave Bing, Spengarn High School graduates, 
And this is a Washington, D.C. based program here. Sure. And we're always concerned. We want to export D.C. culture to the rest of the world. But there's sort of pain in a lot of folks' heart as we talk about an Elgin Baylor and Dave being from Spengarn, that Spengarn is now being closed. Exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a tragedy. Um, and as you say, and I, I'm pretty sure uh, I'm correct in this, but that's of the top 50 players, that's the only school that has two players. And it is a tragedy. But, and I mean, I, I, I don't, I really don't know how to speak to that. I mean, it, uh, other than the fact that it's a tragedy about Spengarn closing. Um, uh, I haven't studied it enough to, to know all of the facts and figures, but I mean, I'm, I'm a DC guy and love DC and like to keep all the traditions going. Um, as you, as, okay, so let's get into, let's get into the basketball, get a little bit. I still want to stay with some players here okay, sure. before, it, how, before we talk about how the game and its players change the world. So let's do this. Let's pick, because you've done the research, you've been a long time student. Let's pick the top. Let's pick. Let's pick the top five players and make a team. Okay, a team. Okay. Now this is a, this okay. is a, this sure. is a team. Okay. So so we need a center. We need two forwards what? and we need two guards. Oh wow, that's um, okay. I, I wanted to make it difficult. Okay, you did. You did. <laughs> I wish you'd give me this question, but I, I'll start with um, man because I want to put I wanna, Adrian Danley is probably going to well Adrian and. And struggle, Elgin. struggle, yeah. struggle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me, okay, just off the top of my head, I'm going to have to say Elgin. Um, so we got, we have Elgin. I'm going to put him at, a, at, at my, my, even though. At the number four position? I'm going to put him at, at the four. At, uh -huh. I'm going to put Adrian Daly at the three, even though he's a three, four. Mm -hmm. Um I'm going to have to put Adrian Lenny. Danley, I mean, in case you guys don't know, Adrian Dantley led the NBA in scoring <laughs> many times. What, Taft Junior High? Then, uh, Taft. Taft then. Junior High, DeMatha High School. DeMatha High School, Notre yeah. Dame. Yeah, and then, and then Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And led the NBA in, in scoring multiple times. At 6'5". At 6'5", at, 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 six six five, five, at, at best. best. <laughs> at With best, elevated right. tennis shoes on. Right, right. Um, I'm going to put, this is a tough one and a stretch. I'm going to put uh, Len Bias at my two because he had strong enough two skills, even though he was a, a three. But we, we, we're crowded at the three. And Len Bias, I, I have to believe, would have been neck and neck with Michael Jordan. I mean, there are a lot of people who argue that, but um, and that's a tragedy in and of itself. And we speak to that, and we speak to at least four people who were pretty close to Len um, in our documentary, because obviously we can't get him. Um, point guard, man, that's, I mean, I'm going to have to come back to the bigs, because we, didn't have, we don't have a lot of bigs who've come out of this area. Um, but who's my point guard? And I don't want to keep this going too long. Um, because he's got, a friend, because he's a friend, I'm gonna have to go with Johnny Dawkins. Um, Johnny even, Dawkins over Austin Carr. Uh, well, as, as, well, see, <laughs> I got my two guard already filled, <laughs> so Austin was a two. <laughs> but man, I mean, we're filled, and this is the thing that we talk about in our documentary is the fact that we have guys in D.C. I mean, and, and one of the things we do is juxtapose us against New York because New York wants to claim that they are who they are, but New York guys are—they want to dribble, they want to take their time. D.C. guys want to get buckets, <laughs> and we get buckets in big numbers. And uh, we, uh, there's a, uh, um, a website, D.C. Basketball, which I write for, mm -hmm. and it streams all the guys from D.C. who, have, who had more than 2,000 points yeah. in their college careers. And some of them are known and some of them aren't known. But um, let, let me, let me okay. jump in here. Okay, sure, you sure. talk about D.C. and New York. Okay. <laughs> I, remember, I remember there was a guy already seven foot one okay. by the yeah. name of... Lou Alcindor, sure, sure. who later came, became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Right, right. He played for Power Memorial right, right. in New York. Sure. And a producer of this show sitting over there in the corner <laughs> is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a guy from New York. Okay. They were unbeatable. Sure. And then they came up against DeMatha. 1965. 1965. Sure and got knocked off that perch right, right. by a D.C. team. <laughs> yeah. so I just want to say that with my New York friend sitting over in the corner. Where there are a few more <laughs> stories like that. There was a team, um, I want to think, they were on, I think it was on Long Island, and the, the Dunbar team from 1975 that had Stacey Robinson, another great basketball player, and they, they had a couple of guys, Wayne McCoy, who went on to greatness at St. John's, and they were number one in the country, and Dunbar went up there and beat them. So, I mean, there are a lot of stories like that. I mean, they come down, and God bless them. I love New York. I do. It's a, one of the best cities in the world, arguably the best city. 
but a lot of times they've come down here with their um their hat in their hand okay. after they left. Okay, so this one maybe is a little, uh, you know, um, this is a, might not be as difficult as the, okay. as the first one. The best team from Washington, D.C. of all time, the best high school team, sort of what year and, and who made it up. I have my thoughts about that, but I, I want to hear yours first. Well, it's funny you say that because one of the things that I know through my writing and getting away from basketball for, for a second, but most people romanticize about their era. Um, my dad would have loved things from the 50s. Um, <laughs> you know, I love things from the late 70s and yeah. early 80s. My nephew loves things from the... Um, okay. but getting back to your question. But I'm, I'm talking about the greatest okay. of all time. So, greatest, <laughs> uh, well, I, I saw that the Matha team in 81 that had Adrian Branch, Bob Ferry, um, Kelvin Johnson. Um, well, I'm, let me go back to... Man. Let me... Let me, okay. let, let, let give, me, me give me some suggestions. I, I will okay, give okay. you a suggestion. <laughs> okay. 1969. I think it was 69. Oh, yeah, okay. I think it was 69. The Ramblin' Wreck from McKinley Tech. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, Bassett, Bassard, yeah, yeah. Apple Milam. That's right. Uh, Kevin Ho. Ke uh, Bradshaw. Uh, yeah, Bradshaw. Bra Kevin Bradshaw, Tatum. The Ma Kevin Tatum. The Magnificent. That, they that, were that, called that was it. That's the, it. the Ma Ma Magnificent Seven. Okay, that's the team. I'm, I'm telling you something. I, I think that might have been the best team ever. But, but, let me say this. I saw them in the, fir the first game that they played against DeMatha that year. They crushed DeMatha. <laughs> they crushed them. However, over at Catholic University, mm -hmm. James Brown was so heavily recruited. James Brown, the CBS sportscaster now, was the most, one of the most heavily recruited basketball players in the history of college recruiting. Mm -hmm. He was recruited so much during his senior year he could jump out the gym. He could do it all. Rebound, shoot, play defense, dribble, smart. He could do it all. Most, one of the most heavily recruited players. He was personally recruited by Ted Kennedy. Talking about basketball players changing the world. Exactly. He was personally recruited by Ted Kennedy and ultimately went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. Well, he played on that DeMatha team that got crushed by McKinley Tech. He was exhausted. And his doctor said that do not allow him to play in some upcoming games. One of those games was against McKinley Tech that year. One of the great moment, moments in Washington, D.C. history. Although I was, <laughs> I was rooting for McKinley Tech. Right. James Brown's jersey was in the chair next to Morgan Wooten. Mm -hmm. James Brown was not. He was at home resting on doctor's orders. I don't think I've ever seen any team ever respond with an, with an effort and with inspiration like that then small DeMatha team. Not nearly as good of a team physically as McKinley Tech. They came out and ran McKinley Tech out, McKinley out of the gym that day. I still think the McKinley Tech, that McKinley Tech team is the best con conglomerate of players on one team. Now, folks argue about Carroll and John Thompson and that group. I forgot about that one. Yeah, but again, it, the, and the story has it that James snuck into the gym and was up in the, in the rafters on, for that game, <laughs> even though he wasn't, I mean, he didn't play, obviously. Yeah, but yeah that was, that was um, and we did um, interview uh, Ronnie Hogue for our, in, uh, for our documentary. Yeah, I let Hogue got Sure, right, sure. Right. Um, but, um, but yeah, so we can go to the, doc the name of the documentary is actually Supreme Courts, mm -hmm. How Washington Basketball Changed the World. And then what, what we talk about in it, not just the people who have made it to the NBA, not the people who have just made it in um, administration in the NBA, but there are, are tons of stories of people who have used the disciplines that they learned in basketball to go on, and, and also the scholarships that they won, to go on to other, uh, other greatness. I mean, there, there are people who, <coughs> again, going back to E.B. Henderson, he coached um, Charles Drew. Yes. He coached um, uh, Duke Ellington. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Charles Drew... You know, I, I don't want to just... We don't have that much time, sure, but sure. I don't want to just fly past those because sure. I want my listening audience to understand why you would be so bold to call this <laughs> Supreme Court how D.C. basketball changed the world. You just mentioned Charles Drew. Right, sure, sure. And also Al Gore played at St. Albans. Right. So these are people who, again, 
they not only played basketball, but they used some of those disciplines. Another person, um, Warren Buffett, played basketball at Wilson High School. I was, I was wondering if sure. you were going, if you were going sure. to actually get to that. Yeah, right, sure. Right, I right. mean, so these are people, I mean, arguably, who are household names and things other than basketball. And they have used some of those disciplines in basketball. <coughs> and, and we also definitely want to challenge other areas. Um, you know, the Chicago's of the world. There's a, a, a great story of, of Wilt Chamberlain coming down here and playing against Elgin Baylor. Elgin doesn't want to talk about it. Wilt can't talk about it. But they said that, you know, you don't have cell phones and stuff, but down at Watts Playground, which is now um, uh, Marvin Gaye Playground, yes. that people were hanging from the rafters yeah. just, just by understanding that these two guys were going to play. And right. Elgin got the best of that 7-1 guy. Well, whether he did or not, we're going to say it because Elgin was from D.C. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> and Wilt, Wilt was from somewhere else. Exactly. And we know Wilt lied. <laughs> we know Wilt lies because Wilt said he bet it. 20,000 women. Absolutely. And I actually did a calculation sure. that if he started when he was 14 years old and <laughs> passed when he passed, it was something like he had to have four or five women every single day of his life. And I just don't think that happened. You lying, Will. <laughs> so we're going we gonna to put it. We're going to say Elgin. We're going to say Elgin got the best. Absolutely. Women. And if Will were to dispute that, we say, well, we know he's lying. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, tell me this. T what, what's going to be the timing of the film, when do you think you guys are going to be uh, we, going to complete that? We really want to wrap up sometime within the next two to three months, and uh, we're going to put it out during basketball season. If we want, if we don't, we aren't able to get it out before the season starts. We definitely want to do it during the All Star game because we're going to take it to an audience of people where we know, and I, and it's probably better to do it that during that time because um, I think the uh, NBA All Star game this year is in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and so if we have that, those people will, and we'll have a few premieres around Washington, obviously. Um, because we can't just relegate, and we don't relegate it to just Washington, D.C. It's the entire metropolitan yes. area because um, uh, Earl Lloyd right, grew up right over in Alexandria. Absolute the first, legend. The first, yeah, right. the first yeah. um, uh, black player to play in the NBA. There were three guys who were drafted that year. He was the first black to play. And then what has come up of today, you look at the Kevin Durant's of the world the, the, um, and the uh, Michael Beasley's. Uh, the Ty Lawson's, all of those are right there in Prince George's County. So we can't relegate it to D.C., but that's where it all started. And this is the kind of conversation you get on the Rock Newman Show. We give the rest of the world culture from D.C. Y'all need to get that. <laughs> we'll be back in just a few moments. is here and no matter what the weather's like outside you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new pohanka hyundai in capitol heights during their giant markdown madness sale smart shoppers know that every new hyundai in pohanka comes with hyundai assurance and america's best 10-year 100,000 mile powertrain warranty but why don't you tell them about the markdown sale joe i'll be happy to kim folks shop around on the web and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 elantra gls at 179 dollars a month today at pohanka hyundai 99 a month that's right a 99 dollars payment on a brand new elantra and 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. Check with 
all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Hall. Hello to all my friends in the DMV. I am Rock Newman from the Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District of Maryland or Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. Today is August the 3rd, 2013. This is The Rock Newman Show. I'm Rock Newman, your host. And um, we are broadcasting for live from the stage of the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Ports at 14th V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. Come on down and join us uh, if you're nearby. If not, tell all your friends to uh, 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 view us anywhere in the world at therocknewmanshow.com. My guest in for this segment will be City Council Member Vincent B. Orange Sr. is Democrat at large from Ward 4 in the District of Columbia. Councilman Orange, welcome to the Rock Newman Show. Thank you for having me. Okay, well, let's jump right into this, man. I right. know you have some commitments and we're so gracious to, to step away and to come down, and, but we're going to let you go uh, back to those uh, commitments. So, but again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so much has been in the news of late about the living wage bill. And man, when you read the headlines about the living wage bill, $12 in the, the council people <clears throat> in an effort to increase the, the income of its residents Correct. have constructed a living wage bill which says that the minimum would be $12.50 for certain companies of certain size. Correct. Um, and certainly on the surface, that sounds like a wonderful thing. Who would root against a living wage bill that's going to pay the employees $12.50? The flip side of that is that there has been much talk about if the mayor approves that bill, if he signs that bill, that Walmart, one of the world's largest retailer, um, would fail to proceed. They would not proceed in anchoring several developments in the city that would create thousands of jobs. And so therefore, it's not a, although it seems on the surface $12.50 is a good thing, living wage bill, it's, it's got a great name, but at the end of the day, it would do more harm than good, and Councilman Orange says what? Well, I, I don't accept that premise that it would do uh, more harm than, than good. Uh, just like your previous guest here with basketball, you know, D.C. basketball changed the world. Well, D.C. living wage would definitely change the world. Uh, the United States Congress um, Democratic Staff Committee on Education and Workforce has indicated if we can just get workers to $25,000 a year, and that's about $12, $12.50 per hour, that we will lift 734,000 people out of poverty, that we will increase GDP by $15 billion, that we will create 132,000 jobs. So we need to understand right now in the nation's capital that this is a nationwide issue right now. You have people striking all over this country now because of what mm -hmm. we did here in Washington, D.C. And we should be leading the way to say we want to have a better quality of life for our residents, which will also impact the nation. 
the policy that we are projecting now is a living wage, affordable housing, access to health care, and a good education, and you can begin to build a good family here in the nation's capital, which would reverberate throughout the world. Yeah, you know something, man? That, that, is, that is absolutely practical. You know, I, I sense that as being, you know, practical and, reason and, a, and a reasonable goal. Um, there are, you as a strong proponent of the living wage bill, um, put forth that as a, you know, one great reason that one, the, the, the nation's capital should lead the way. In a little bit, we may have enough time to get into, we say on the nation's capital should lead the way. I often talk about that this is the seat of democracy for the world and we don't have democracy here because we don't have, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have full representation, uh, you know, of, of our vote. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the, the opponents and as the mayor who sat here, and I don't think that anyone would dispute whether or not the mayor has the best interests of the citizens at heart. I, I, I don't think anybody would dispute that. But he seems, he obviously, the bill hadn't gotten to his desk yet. There are some accusations about that being politics, the reason why it hasn't, hasn't gotten to his desk. But um, when it gets to his desk, it seems every indication is that he will not, that he will veto the bill. And, you know, that, that would be very unfortunate because if he vetoes the bill, basically he will become one of the bigger subsidizers of Walmart. Uh, if Walmart pays our citizens $8.25 per hour, that's about $17,000 on an annual basis, we will pick up the social costs. That is because those employees will not be able to afford or have benefits. So our Section 8 housing is going to go up because they're still going to need access to housing. Uh, the, the, their households, their children will still use the school lunch and breakfast programs. They'll be, they'll be applying for food stamps. They'll need access to health care. They'll need energy assistance with their utility bills. Uh, in the words of, uh, of Congressman John Lewis, they're nothing but starvation wages. They're poverty wages. And it's unfortunate that uh, we would even think about vetoing this bill when we just invited Costco to the nation's capital. They've been here about six months. They're doing extremely well. But they pay, on average, their employees $21.96 per hour. 84% of the employees right now at Costco are D.C. residents. And they support the living, they support the living wage. Uh, we also have Trader Joe's in town. They pay a nice hourly wage. So it can be done. Uh, uh, is, it, is it Walmart's resistance to this living wage bill? Is that just simply an approach that of greed? Is, is, would it be your contention that that's simply a matter of greed? Certainly we see the billions and billions and billions of profit they make. Well, I, I would put it like this. Last year, uh, Walmart uh, generated in excess of $470 billion in sales. Their net income was $17 billion. Their CEO makes $11,000 an hour or as Ralph Nader would say, $200 per minute. And in one day, that CEO makes $88,000. And that is about you five. You're making me want to be the CEO yeah. of Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and that's about five uh, individuals making eight twenty-five dollars per hour in one day. He makes what they make in one year. So what we're saying is, OK, maybe you may not make $17 billion in net income. Maybe you're going to make $16.5 billion. So share the wealth. Share the prosperity. The doors of the nation's capital are open to Walmart and any other large retailer. What we're saying is that you must share the prosperity so we don't have to pick up the social costs. Now, the District of Columbia, for, uh, we're doing well. We're just coming off of $800 million in surpluses over our last four fiscal years. Right. We're projected a $600 million surplus over our next four or five fiscal years. We have $1.5 billion in the bank. Uh, we have a larger concentrated consumer base in the District of Columbia with disposable income. That's the reason why Walmart is knocking on our door. They want what we have. We have the disposable income. We have 67 cranes in this city right now in development projects. We have a plan where we're, go we're going to create 50,000 jobs over the next 10 years. And all of this was without taking Walmart 
into our equation. So Walmart can help us move forward, but it's not like we, we you know, our economy is going to roll over and die because Walmart doesn't. Well, let, let me ask, you know, like a neighborhood, um, and for the life of me, I'm from. It's not Parklands, but the, where Walmart, Walmart was planning to come over there in Southeast. Skyland. Uh, Skyland. Yes. And, and Skyland. That that's been an area. That's been an area of blight for a very long time. Yes. The developer there contends that if the living wage go bill goes through and if Walmart pulls out, there's absolutely not another, re there's not another retailer who has uh, come close to committing to anchoring that project and so therefore the project wouldn't go forth and the prospect being that um, that there would be blight there for multiple more years. Well, you know, once again, I, I don't, I don't buy into that premise as, as well. You know, I was, I've been going to the uh, the ICSC, the International Conference of Shopping Centers, for the last 13 years. Okay. I've been there when all these deals are being put together, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously, maybe he may have uh, some setback. But at the end of the day, all roads lead to the east of the river. Uh, and that's the reason why they're now having discussions on relaxing the height restrictions because the best views are from east of the river. Right. East of the river will be developed, so we can't get caught up in the hype. It's sort of like what uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said back in 1938 when he was dealing with the New Deal and he was dealing with the minimum wage. Don't believe that hype. And here we are today, you know, we, we've, we're doing well. There's a discussion now on the Hill about increasing the minimum wage to $10.10 per hour, which if that happens, that means in D.C. the minimum wage will be $11.10. What has happened since the late 1980s up until now is that there has not been a progression of wages along with the productivity of this country. Right. And that's why people are now all across America, they're yeah. striking, they're, they're raising, yeah, the gap. raising hell. The gap. Like, the, you the, know, the, the, the gap. Yeah. The, 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 the gap. gap. The gap is... is, is, the, is the rich keep getting richer it, and the yeah, poor keep yeah. getting poor. Yeah, and you know, that's far more than just a cliche. You know, Jay-Z was on, um, Jay -Z was on uh, Bill Maher's show just, just recently, and, and, and he talked about that, you know, and he talked about the frustration of those who are left out and that there, is, there should be reason for concern because when folks see that reality of the rich just keep getting richer and the poor just keep getting poorer, you know, how that frustration is manifested is in many different antisocial ways. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the classic example, two people making the minimum wage, $8.25 per hour, means that their household income will be about $35,000. You can't buy a home in D.C. with a household income of $35,000. So if I can just get you to twelve fifty per hour, two people working together, their household income is going to be $52,000. I can at least get you a house. Now, that house is not going to be downtown at that new city center they built right. in that billion-dollar project, right. but you can purchase a home in the city along with our policy of access to affordable housing access to health care, and then a good education. If you've been here during the bad times, you deserve to be here during the good times. Right. Who are we building all this for? Right. And I mean, that's, that's the question. Right. These thousand of residents that come in each, and, uh, each month, you know, or, you know, what are we doing in this city? Yeah. We, we got to make sure that we are diverse, that we're balanced, and that everyone can at least have a good quality of life and an opportunity to dream and have hope. Last, thing, last thing on that subject, because uh, I do want to try to get in a couple of other uh, pieces, um, that it's unfair, that it's that it's singularly targets Walmart and it doesn't include other retailers. No, it, it, the bill, uh, uh, the, the requirements of the bill, if you generate in excess of $1 billion and your footprint is greater than 75,000 square feet, you fall under the definition of having to pay the living wage. Now, the minimum wage for, for, for the, uh, that the federal government has put in place, if you generate more than $500,000, you must pay the minimum wage. So that's just a, another collateral issue. That's an, uh, some other myth that, that you know the, the opposition utilizes. But at the end of the day, it's not unfair. Is what's unfair is what they're doing to citizens in the District of Columbia and to people across this nation, providing them starvation wages while they enjoy a good life. And, you know, Matthew 19:24. it's easier for a camel <laughs> to get through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. And so they need to take heed that, you know, people are sick and tired of being taken advantage of. And we're just saying share a little bit of prosperity. It's not much, it's just a little bit. You know, in the, la in the uh, last hour today, uh, we have uh, guest Phil Fornacki. He's with the uh, Washington Lawyers uh, Group that just, and, and they just co-authored a report that talks about 
the, the African American population in Washington, D.C. now being be certainly below 50%, but that 83% of all arrests are of African American individuals, and 91% of all, all drug arrests are of African American individuals. Um, I saw Kathy Lanier's response, and it seems, which is as I observe, that Kathy Lanier has been a good police chief um, and that she cares about the community. Um, I, I saw her response. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, having seen, have you had a chance to see this report? Are you aware of it? I, I, have, I have not seen a report. I've, I've heard her. So the headline. Yeah, yeah. so the headline. But, but I would say even that if you were to do the profile of, of, the, of the restees, and you will pr probably see that, uh, you know, we have not been doing a good job with providing them an opportunity to have a, access to a good quality of life. At the end of the day, it's, it's all about access. And if, if I'm providing you, at least with shelter, uh, with transportation and clothes, you can get up every day and then go out and, and tackle the world. But if you don't have the basics in life, then you can't move forward. And that's why, you know, getting back to the issue we're talking about, if I'm just paying you enough just to get to work, but you can do nothing else, that means, one, you got to go out and get another job, are you going to go get involved in something else? You're not going to have the time to really raise your children because you're still you're trying to pay this utility bill. So, you know, at the end of the day, w I would rather work for Costco where a typical employee is making $45,000 a year as opposed to Walmart where the typical employee is making $17,486 a year. Let me figure that out. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me ask you, um, three of your council members have put their hat in the ring to run for mayor. The mayor, Mayor Gray, has not announced that he will run yet. Um, you uh, backing anyone that's put their head in the ring yet? I'm keeping my powder dry at, at this point. I, I think it's too early. Uh, uh, there's a lot of other factors that, that are going to come into to this equation. And uh, I don't think everybody's in the race yet. So we'll just have to wait and see. Any chance Vincent Orange might? Throw his hat in the ring. I said, "You never know." I'm gonna keep my powder dry at this point. You heard it. Things, you heard it today. Vince Norris said that he was gonna run for mayor in in in, in, the, in the upcoming mayor race. <laughs> I think as we extract as we extrapolate <laughs> here on the Rock Newman Show. Thank you, Vince Norris, so, so much for much. joining it's us. Always a pleasure. We'll be back in just a moment. Thank you, sir. I'm Rock Newman from The Rock Newman Show, and I am absolutely flattered to have as one of my fine advertisers the DMV's greatest corporate citizen. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Pohanka Automotive Group. If you have any automotive needs whatsoever, if you want to sell your car, buy a car, trade in your car, have your car serviced, whatever you need, see my good friends at the Pohanka Automotive Group you will be well taken care of, I promise. I'm Rock Newman, I might be there. Come on down and see our good friends at Pohanka Automotive Group.
is Leprechaun Tim Pohanka from Pohanka Nissan and Pohanka Hyundai. It's hard to be down on your luck when you're Virginia's first choice for new Nissan and Hyundais, but I need to sell 60 cars this week. Right now, I'll pay you big bucks for your good luck. Right now, you've got people credit approval process. The banks are looking to get lucky and lend to you, even if you've been turned down before. Bring me any good luck charm, and I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car today. Hurry, once I get rid of 60 cars, the luck runs out. All offers require bank approval, so call us at 1-800-POHANKA, visit Poanka Nissan and Poanka Hyundai on Route 1 in Fredericksburg, or better yet, log on to timpoankaforthepeople.com. And when we make a deal, I promise it'll be your lucky day. I'm Tim Poanka, and I'm a leprechaun for the people. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back. Today is Saturday, August the 3rd, 2013. Uh, this is The Rock Newman Show. We're broadcasting live from the stage of the Langston Hughes Room at Busboys and Poets. Um, I certainly uh, welcome those of you who are just tuning in. Uh, our guest in this segment is Fox News political analyst um, Juan Williams. Uh, Juan Williams has been a, a fixture, a media fixture in the Washington, D.C. area for quite some time. He has built quite a reputation for himself. And uh, Juan Williams, welcome to The Rock Newman Show. Thank you so All much right. for coming. Well, you built a reputation for yourself. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am actually uh, uh, honored that you are here. Juan, let's jump in because you are in a very interesting position, let's call it. <laughs> and that is you've been someone that had developed a reputation for having a keen sensitivity towards what's going on in the culture, what's going on in the country, and a sensitivity for the underdog. Right. You've developed that reputation. Just recently, um, you quite vociferously uh, made a comment, um, and let me kind of get through this here. You said that Al Sharpton and Michael Eric Dyson were hustlers and frauds for criticizing white folks like Bill O'Reilly mm -hmm. um, and, and for de demonizing fo wh white folks like Bill O'Reilly. Now, I recently saw an interview uh, that you were on with Sean Hannity, who I want to talk to you about in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and Leo Terrell was on that show. Now, Leo Terrell, the civil rights attorney, was involved with O.J. Simpson back in the day. Frankly speaking, I much agreed with your position in that debate much more than I did with Leo's. I mean, I, I thought Leo Terrell at that point, he was talking about the Trayvon Martin trial, and he was talking about the evidence, what the, what the jurors had to go on the evidence, and he was telling everybody, you didn't know what the hell you were talking about, but he called you, he said you were just like Al Sharpton and Michael Eric Dyson. You called Michael Eric Dyson and Al Sharpton hustlers and frauds. How do we reconcile all of that? So much. <laughs> <laughs> but I would start by saying that, you know, my feeling about the Zimmerman Martin case was that the jury may not have had enough evidence to prosecute, but in my mind, a jury is not there simply to look at the technicalities. They had to have a sense of the community standards and what justice would amount to, especially when you have a dead child and grieving parents. And Leo, as a lawyer, he was trying to just eliminate all of that. That's yeah, just, said, just, just I, what the evidence, I, only the evidence they had. And I appreciate the perspective, but I mean, if you just wanted to have a jury of legal experts and lawyers who would say, what is the evidence? But you know what? I think that the prosecution may have made a mistake. Maybe, mistake. maybe they should have brought uh, a charge of first degree murder uh, instead of second degree, or maybe the third degree, I don't know, or manslaughter, manslaughter or, or, right. or a weapons right. charge, yeah. I don't know. A lesser charge to make it more likely that they could prove that. Something charge. else. Right. They needed something else, because to my mind, allowing Zimmerman to walk free and even returning the gun to him was, to me, an injustice and wrong. That's the way I felt, and that's what I said. Terrell's position was that by saying that, I was somehow ignoring the laws and, and, and feeding the fires or something like that of anger in the black community. So that, I guess that explains my position there. Now with regard to Sharpton and, and Dyson, what happened here was in the aftermath of this, you get people like Bill O'Reilly, who I work with at Fox, saying, hey, you know what, there's some larger problems inside the black community having to do with out-of-wedlock birth, that's Bill O'Reilly's big thing, 
But if you extend that into high dropout rates, achievement gaps in schools, high incarceration rates, high poverty rates, high unemployment rates, we could go on. You know about these problems inside the community. So that then sparked people who said, oh, Bill O'Reilly and the white conservatives in Fox News are trying to distract from anger over the Zimmerman-Martin verdict. And which I thought, well, that's interesting because we've had these ongoing problems in our community way before the tragedy of what happened with Trayvon Martin in Florida. And the question is, how do we deal with it? Now, you may not be aware of this, Rock, but I wrote a book now five years ago called Enough. And the subtitle of the book is Phony Leaders, Dead End Movements, and Culture of Failure That's Undermining Black America and What We Can Do About It. And in that book, I hit hard at people like Sharpton. And the book actually focuses on Bill Cosby, the comedian, probably someone you know well. And Cosby had come out some time ago on the 50th anniversary of Brown and said, you know what, we got problems in this community, and why is it that we're having a celebration of Brown when we got kids who don't even know what Brown is about and don't appreciate education, want to tell you that if you go to school and you, ex you excel, you're acting white. Why aren't we talking about what's going on in our community? Well, Cosby got criticized. And who was the ace number one critic of Bill Cosby? Michael Eric Dyson. What did Dyson say? This is evidence of the black middle class being ashamed of poor black people and doesn't, don't feel comfortable with the way white people react when they see poor black people on the street or in distress. Okay, um, you know what? I don't think that anyone could for one second argue with anything that you just said there. Um, it seems to me what, and I don't need to defend Sharpton or um, Michael Eric Dyson, my God, they do that very oh, well. They, they, and they're great speakers. They, they speak very well for, for themselves. Mm -hmm. But it seems as if what happened, first of all, I think there is a palpable feeling, if not understanding, that a Bill O'Reilly Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity really doesn't give a damn about what's happening in the black community. I that, wouldn't say that. Well, I, but I would say that that's the that that perception exists. Yeah. And I would say that they largely are voices for a conservative point of view in terms of American politics. I don't know that that means that they don't give a hoot. But what I would say is their audiences, you know, don't give a hoot. Well, no, their audiences are conservatives. Right. And so their pres prescriptions, their attitude towards so many of the issues that we talk about, you were just having an intense conversation with Councilman Orange about minimum wage laws. Sure. They would say minimum wage laws act to depress job markets for low-skilled workers. That's not what you heard from Vincent Orange. That's not what you'd hear from most people in the black community. That's different than saying they don't give a hoot. Well, you know, as their body of work has been presented for a very long time, right. you know, I would submit that the impression that most people who are in the quote unquote victim position, minority community or otherwise, right. you look at their body of work over a period of time and they have been, they've just thrown bricks, they've thrown rocks and they have seemed to, they appear all the time not to give a damn and that, that you know, kick somebody when they're down. I just don't see, you know, here's what I, one of the questions I would ask you, well, for let's example, stay with, let's let, stay let, with let, that. Let me, let me finish with that, that, that point. Let me finish okay. that point though for, right. for, for a second. You know, you, I watch a Sean Hannity and I see him talk about the Trayvon Martin trial mm -hmm. and what is, what's his crash and bang and MMA style that, that, that Trayvon Martin had this guy down and over and over and over he repeats that, right? Right. Okay. I want to just surmise for a second. Let's flip the script. Let's say that a young, skinny, 17-year-old, blonde, blue-eyed kid was walking through the community, and a 26, 27-year-old black guy got out of a car with a gun and went and attacked this, uh, went and confronted this kid. They got in a fight, and then the black man shot this white, blue-eyed guy. How do you think Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity would have responded to that. You think their response would have been a whole lot different? I don't know, but I mean, obviously, you sound like me arguing with them. And you sound like me arguing with Leo Terrell. This, we kicked off this conversation mm -hmm. about. But the point is, to me, we can argue the Martin case, 
And I, again, I agree with you on this. I think that there's racial profiling involved. I think there's racial differential in the administration of justice. This is what I was saying about that case. Mm -hmm. That's my feeling. Mm -hmm. But that, to me, does not distract. You talk about body of work. I'm, we can get back to that in a minute. Sure. But that does not take away from ongoing big issues in our community. Yeah, which and when you get civil rights leaders who will say, you know what, all I want to talk about is Martin mm -hmm. and the death of that child. Right. And I'm not going to allow people to address these ongoing major issues like, you know, we're sitting here in Washington, D.C. We know about right. violence. Do we know about gunfire. We know about Chicago and the record amount of carnage on the streets every day. And that's yeah. black on black. There's yeah. no white people involved. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me intentional blindness when you say, let's focus on the white conservatives or Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity, and let's ignore it. We don't want to talk about is what would require moral courage, Rock, moral courage to speak to each other mm -hmm. in very demanding, concrete ways about issues we need to resolve. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is fair, again, going back to Sharpton and, and Dyson, do you think it is fair to characterize them as only having an interest in talking about the Trayvon Martin case, that they don't, that they don't have a body of work of trying to eradicate some of the problems well, look, that exist we that we're get, talking about? Look, I, I have respect for Sharpton, but I must tell you, if you want to talk about body of work, we can go down a deep and dark hole. I mean, Tawana Brawley and lots of other things that people would bring up as points of intense criticism mm -hmm. of his body of work. Mm -hmm. And when you want to talk about body of work, I don't know where we would go. Dyson's an academic. He's a writer, very capable speaker. But in terms of helping people, I don't know what organized efforts he's put forward. So if you want to talk about body of work, here my point is, if you care about our community, if you're about helping people, especially people who are disadvantaged and especially young people in need of education and opportunity, getting a, you know, a step, first step on that ladder of upward mobility so they can make it in this country, I think you've got to be about helping them get a better education, making sure they have adequate housing, making sure they've got the support networks if their family isn't there, talking honestly with people about the damage that comes from broken families and out of wedlock birth talking about violence and, and what damage comes from you know, involvement with the criminal justice system in this country, but not talking about it in a way that says, you're a victim and you can't help yourself and it's just the man in the system and it's Bill O'Reilly. This is foolishness to me. This is a distraction from the real business of our generation. We are honored to be the children of the civil rights generation. We should be about the movement of today, which is improving our community. As you, you, you've been an observer again for a very long time, of all that, of really all that goes on, you've written about it, you've talked about it, you've been, you've been a commentator. Well, let me just put a plug in and say, I wrote Eyes on the Prize, yes. and we have, by the way, an anniversary uh, edition of that book coming out, 50th <laughs> March in Washington and all that. That's but, quite okay. That's quite okay. As a promoter, I understand. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I wrote a biography of Thurgood Marshall, okay. and uh, I've written books about historically black colleges, about black religion in America. How do you respond to people who are frustrated with Awan Williams working at Fox and said the only way you could possibly continue to be a uh, uh, um, employed at Fox is that you had to sell out, <laughs> you know, you had to sell out. Now, people are saying that about Sharpton at MSNBC. The only way Sharpton could keep his job, Sharpton is not being true to the cause because now he sits down with Obama, he has access to Obama, so he no longer is as critical of Obama as he should be. Now, there may have been some criticisms that I missed, but frankly speaking, when it comes to Sharpton and Obama and some of what seems to me was his past history of criticism and complaints. I haven't seen many much lately. So he, he's been accused of selling out. Is, would that be fair? Is it in any way fair that Awan Williams sells out? The only way you can stay employed at a Fox News is to sell out. Well, if there was evidence, in other words, if you could say to me, hey, Juan, why'd you say this? Then I'd say, okay, well, let me explain it. But I don't even know what it is to explain. We just had a discussion about my differences with so many of the leading personalities at Fox about the Martin Zimmerman verdict. So you know I'm, I'm there 
stating my point of view very forcefully, and it's not the case anybody's telling me what to say or what I can't say, because yeah, I, I say it. Which is part of the reason why I thought the Leo Terrell exchange was quite extraordinary. Well, I'm just telling you, and, and, and but I, you can, that's not extraordinary. You can watch any day of the week on Fox, and you can see the role I play. Well, I'm actually talking more, more so about it almost... <laughs> <laughs> It, uh, it almost seemed as if Leo Terrell might have been auditioning that particular day because he was so vociferous, and he got to talking about Melissa Harris Perry and oh. no, she's not holding a child and that sort of thing. Um, again, what was that? That that, that he, he here's what he said that day that all that these black commentators like Melissa Harris Perry says that now they're holding their children tighter. Oh, oh and then oh. he said, no, they're not. And I and I frankly thought that you know. That was insensitive like it was insensitive for the blogger who came on Fox and said that uh, Trayvon Martin's mother was using him only for employment, was, didn't care about him in the past. What? I didn't ever heard. Anyway, I didn't hear that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So part of the question and some of the, you know, when I announced that you, you were coming on, one of the questions that I got mm -hmm. was ask Juan if he feels that he has any particular restrictions that Fox News is clearly speaks to a conservative no population, right. and their storylines are skewered to edify and satisfy those viewers. Mm -hmm. And in that context, do you feel any particular pressure to fall in line with that? No. In fact, you know, remember who you're talking to. I got fired by NPR <laughs> because they didn't like things that I said. So I. I know what it means to have editorial control over your comments, your writings, your thinking. And one of the oddities of my life, of my existence, Rock, is I go to Fox and there's no constraint. I mean, in a way, you could say they don't care what you say because you're not one of them. Mm -hmm. and, they, and the idea is you come in and you stir the pot and they argue with you and I'm a foil and all the rest. But I'm, a, I'm able to do my job to be a journalist, to give you my thoughts freely. Mm -hmm. uh, without constraint. So I guess that, you know, it comes at something of a cost. There's certain things I will never be able to do, uh, given that we have a strong conservative audience. Yeah. What this means is you're going to have to come back here again, because we got <laughs> a lot more to talk about. Yeah. Thanks Thank for having me. Thank you, Ron Williams. Up next, Mayor for Life, City Council member from Ward 8, Marion S. Barry. Back in a moment. <laughs> to all my friends in the DMV. I am Rock Newman from The Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District of Maryland of Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor. <laughs>
Hello to all my friends in the DMV. I am Rock Newman from The Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District, Maryland of Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. Again, today is August the 3rd, 2013. Uh, we are broadcasting from Bus Boys and Poets here in Washington, D.C. at 14th and V Street. And my guest needs no introduction whatsoever. He is affectionately referred to as Mayor for Life, Marion S. Barry. Marion Barry, welcome to the Rock News. Right. Good month. Sound good, 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 good. Thank you so much for taking time Thank out of you your, your day. I know you got all kind of activities I got today. I boat ride after this. You, the bond just passed in our neighborhood. And yeah. We were having the boat ride. He decided to keep it anyway but yeah. because he wanted it to happen. Mm -hmm. He's one of our leading business people and spokesperson, community activist, a uh, friend of mine, head of the uh, Ward 8 Business Council, right. a lot of other things. So he's uh, going to be sure to miss our community. He uh, has a building. Name out him, the yeah. Bond Building. The Bond Building. Right. 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 King right. Avenue. Right, right. And I remember when he was uh, getting it bricked up. Yeah. And he forgot to get a couple of permits. <laughs> and, they, and they closed him down. I got him done the next day. I said, look at that. No, that's, that was just an oversight. He called Marion Barry. Marion yeah. Barry, Mar Mar Barry fixed it. Marion Barry. He fixed it. <laughs> um, right. You know, I've, come, I've sort of become, uh, I'm tired of helping people in this town, which you know. Mm hmm I sort of become the go-to person mm -hmm. on the council. You got a problem? Call Marion Barry. Right. I mean, every day we get, I don't know how many calls we get in my office. So we've had to limit it to, if you don't live in Ward 8, unless you're a, fresh, a friend of mine or something, yeah. we, we just overload it. You know what? It's very interesting that you say that. I had the three candidates for mayor that who now sit on the council, Tommy Wells, Muriel Bowser, and Jack Evans on the show here uh, yes. a little while ago. And each of them, now obviously Marion Barry has gotten his share of criticism, but those three council members continually evoked your name as having done something good. I cautioned them, I said the three of you are running for mayor. If you keep talking about what a great job Marion is doing, he might come back and try to run. For, <laughs> he might try to come back and run for mayor uh, uh, again. Now, one of them said that, which just surprised me. I mean, I, it's not something I had heard. That in terms of the environment, that Marion Barry was the strongest environmentalist on the council. Yeah, sure. And I said, is, you know, I kind of couldn't help the joke. I said, is that because he doesn't like a lot of smoke and fog and stuff around or that sort of thing? <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. I knew you couldn't. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, let me ask you, um, I was just talking to Vincent Orange earlier about a very important subject for the residents of the District of Columbia, and that, w that is the living wage bill. The living wage bill, which Mayor Gray has given every indication. He hasn't made a commitment yet. But he's given every indication that he's going to veto that bill when it gets to his desk. Would that be the wrong thing for him to do? Well, let me just speak on a living wage first. Vincent Owens did a hell of a job of leading the council that was in his committee and got it out, got to the council floor, had healthy debate. We won it by, by 8 to 5 uh, on, the, on the D.C. City Council. And I want you to be expressive. I just want people to go. First of all, he's an alpha brother, so all the alphas are good people. Alphas, alphas, alphas. <laughs> <laughs> not Q's, not Capitals, not Sigmas. The beginning. But alphas. The alphas in the beginning. beginning. All right. But uh, <clears throat> that bill was important to a lot of DC residents, not just my jobs. But Vincent Bill and I were talking two days ago. It was like David slaying Goliath. 
Walmart is a, had profits of $15 billion last year, had sales of over $400 billion last year. And here we have a little ragtag uh, group down the city council defeated that craziness. At twelve fifty, dollars right? That's only $26,000 a year before taxes. Right. After taxes get taken out, that's not a living wage in, in any way, quite frankly. Right. It needs to be fifteen, maybe fifteen, sixteen, seventeen dollars an hour to get us out of this poverty that we're in. You know, we have eighteen thousand families on TANF, the welfare program, mm -hmm. thirty-one thousand children, and so that's the context of that. Mm -hmm. But back to Mira Bowser, Jack Evans, and Tim Wells. Mm -hmm. First of all, Mira Bowser's father, Joe Bowser, was my seventy-eight. Ward 5 coordinator, my 82 Ward 5 coordinator, my 86 Ward 5 coordinator. Mira was 14 when we, in 78 when we started doing this. And she remembers passing out a leaflet for me. You know, plus what I've tried to do with young people like Mira and others is help them understand our history, understand where black folks fitted in, I didn't fit in during that period, right. and where we are now. That's right. in terms of mirror. So Jack Evans, when I was mayor, uh, there was an issue in Blue Point Circle. I can't remember what the issue was. But I came down on the side, he was an NC commissioner. I came down on the side of that issue that Jack supported. And that sort of propelled him into uh, politics after John Wilson, uh, unfortunately, you know, killed himself. Sure. And then in terms of Tommy Wells, uh, Tommy Wells was in, working in Arkansas for Jesse Jackson. And Anita Bond was a national field coordinator for Jesse Jackson. And Anita Bond, who's now yeah, at the Arts yeah. Council. Mm -hmm. And I was a real strong supporter and everything of Jesse, Jesse Jackson. In fact, I nominated him in San Francisco. Right. Uh, Anita called uh, Tommy Wells. I said, what can we do to get some white folks in Arkansas voting for Jesse Jackson? He did the best he could. Right. Then when he came to Washington, he went to work for me, mm -hmm. one of my Ward 6 coordinators. Right. And so I have connections, personal connections, right. with all three of them. Right. Doesn't that mean I agree with 100% of their politics, sure. that, which I don't, right. uh, particularly if it relates to black folks. And I tell Jack all the time, I said, Jack, you can't. And he, he, I'm, on, I'm on financial revenue with him. Right. We get along very well. Mm -hmm. And I said, Jack, you can't win this race without strong black support. You just can't sure. do it. Right. And I represent, I don't intend to pretend to represent all the black folks, but I represent the views <coughs> and thoughts of a whole bunch of black folks. Because mm -hmm. people know I'm a stand-up black person, black to the bone, DNA blackness. And so the three of them uh, have a... Uh, a personal relationship I mean, over right. the years. Well, let me ask you. Um, I'll, I'll ask you the same question I asked uh, Vincent Orange. The three of them have thrown their hat in the ring. Of uh, 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 Vince Gray has not announced whether or not he's going to run for, for mayor yet. Um, is it too early for you to give a nod to who you might endorse? Absolutely, it's too early. You've been around me, Rock. You know I'm a very strategic person. You know I don't just jump out of here because somebody asked me a question. You, you've been around me, so you know i got to ask that question. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> this is your show. You both do that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, I've been a strong supporter of Vincent Gray. Mm -hmm. uh, ward 8 carried him over the top. Right. If he had not carried Ward 8 in the large numbers that we got out, mm -hmm. he would not be mayor today. Right because Ward 5 balanced out some parts of Ward 3, uh, Ward 2. And so when it came down to it, you know, the big book we got in Ward 8 did it. And I have been an ally of his on the council. He's made some decisions that I just vigorously disagree with in terms of jobs and, mm -hmm. and other kind of things, and not responding to uh, the black community like he should. Mm -hmm. I tell him, all the time I talk to him, uh, I said, Mr. Mayor, you got 83% of the black folk, 83% of the black folk. And you have a responsibility to give us something, mm -hmm. more than just lip service, you know, you know that. not just East River, but give black people some job opportunities. Strengthen our education system, because in Ward 8, we have 20 public schools. Now, one of them had proficiency over 50%. 
It's just crazy. And so I'm waiting to see what happened. But what I'm going to do, I'm joining with Yvette Alexander. We're going to put together an East River agenda mm -hmm. because we've been discriminated against. I had Terry Bellamy out from DOT the other day looking at some streets. We've been discriminated even in that area. So, so you're going to put together an agenda? An agenda. And that any, mm -hmm. is, that, is that an agenda that will sort of be an acid test for who ultimately you might throw it, your it, support behind? It would be an acid test for the entry. Mm -hmm. That's how you get in it. Mm -hmm. If you don't pass that test, you won't be considered by me. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of right. in terms of you won't consider to give your support to somebody yeah, right. that is not paying the right kind of sensitivity no, to right. the agenda that got, you all are developing. Got to, got to, right. because Ward Eight is ninety eight percent African American. Right. Skyland is seven or eight. Ward seven. Sk Skyland yeah. is Skyland yeah. is seven. And Ward Eight is and Ward Seven is about ninety percent African American. Right, right. So so to Skyland for a second, because what you hear from Victor Hoskins the mayor's uh, deputy mayor for economic development, and some from the mayor, is they make a case and point about Skyland. Skyland has been a site of blight for many, many, many years. And now that there was real optimism about turning that blight around with development there, that the development has said that there's a commitment from Walmart to go there. That if this living wage bill passes, Walmart is saying it absolutely will not go there and it won't go in several other places and spaces around the city, therefore potentially costing uh, just a three, four, you know, different counts, uh, thousands of jobs. And your re response to that is? Well, first of all, I'm a strong supporter of uh, Scott and even though it's right on the border of seven and eight. Uh, we try to get a Walmart in more than eight, but there's just no space. Mm -hmm. uh, for that, so I told you that I'll support that. She has two potential ones. But the day before the vote, on that Tuesday, before Wednesday, the top Walmart people came to see me. They were, they were my, was a good friend and my lawyer over the years. Yeah. Was their chief lobbyist, and so I did it. Dave Wilmot. Dave Wilmot, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. They, they came to see you personally, came to see yeah. all the council people? No, they came to see me. Per okay. So I said oh. the word, if you don't come see me, there's no discussion. You know, that's how I operate, you know. Mm -hmm. I got one vote, but I got a little bit more than one vote because I influenced a few other votes okay. on the council. All right. And uh, almost from the very beginning, this guy sat down. I mean, I got some news for you, Mr. Barry. If this bill passes, uh, we, we certainly want to rethink our position about the three stores we have under construction, but certainly we might pull out of the other three stores. Right. I said, hey, wait a minute, Randy. You know me? I'm not going to be stuck up. Just because you're a big company, a multi-billion dollar company, I'm not going to be stuck up. Because there are other big retailers who could come to Galilee. In fact, Gary Rappaport, who's a good friend of mine and the developer, had been talking to Target about that. And then Walmart came along and offered a better deal. That's it. <clears throat> so I suspect that they're not going to leave Skyland. Even if, even if the mayor vetoes the bill, I suspect he's going to make a deal with them that they do Skyland. Because he was one of the strongest advocates of Skyland out yeah. in Las Vegas. Right. And they talked to Walmart. Right. Here's what's happening to Walmart. I've noticed when Vincent talked about this. Walmart and stores like that have saturated the suburbs. Yes. Look around this. Right, yeah. sure, sure. And, and we're the only market left. Yeah. And particularly we're having these affluent white people uh, coming into D.C., about a thousand a month. Uh, we, we have spent with income now. We have places we can go. I was surprised that Walmart would put six Walmarts here. I, I, I mean, I really was. Yeah. They must know something that I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I question that myself as yeah. to whether or not, you know, that, that scene that appeared to be a glut, but you make a point. Folks are coming in by the droves that have much more expendable income. But I don't understand the world on East Capitol Street. Uh, I understand the developer they called me about voting uh, against the bill. Mm -hmm. I was lobbied against the bill. David lobbied me against the bill. Uh, some other of my friends called Bailey against the bill. But see, I have a commitment to our people, <clears throat> you know, 
And that living wage, $26,000, is not really a living wage. Right. That's before taxes. Mm-hmm. Once you get taxes, you make, you know, you live, you've been in Washington a long time. Your family been in this DMV sure. Sure. for a long time. It, even with two people, to live just comfortably, it probably takes about forty-five, fifty thousand dollars a family just to live comfortably, right. not not to be extravagant. Mm-hmm. Live comfortably. Then you got kids, mm-hmm. and so right now, you have a situation with tanner workers, tanner clients. The thirty-one thousand children, eighteen thousand family. If you make over fourteen hundred dollars working in the private sector, you get your fourteen hundred dollars taken from you. What the damn? What is the incentive? Right. What's the incentive for you to go to work? Also, a rock, as you very well know, there are black boys in this city who will never, ever. Seen a black man get him go to work. Right. Has never right. ever right. Uh, seen that happen. Right. And so we're pushing now. But, and and that's I mean when you when you when you make that point, the impact of that's the reality of that statement. Yeah. That a young black man has never seen a grown black man get up and go, go to, to work. work. That's right. That is a tragedy. We'll talk more when we come back with Mayor for Life, Marion Barrett. Hello to all my friends in the DMV. I am Rock Newman from The Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District of Maryland or Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor.
This is Leprechaun Tim Pohanka from Pohanka Nissan and Pohanka Hyundai. It's hard to be down on your luck when you're Virginia's first choice for new Nissan and Hyundais, but I need to sell 60 cars this week. Right now, I'll pay you big bucks for your good luck. Bring down any good luck charm you've gotten based on the sale price of the car you choose. I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car this week. Today, your lucky penny is worth plenty, up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car you want. Stop moping and hoping you'll get approved. With my For the People credit approval process, the banks are looking to get lucky and lend to you, even if you've been turned down before. Bring me any good luck charm and I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car today. Hurry, once I get rid of 60 cars, the luck runs out. All offers require bank approval, so call us at 1-800-POHANKA, visit Poanka Nissan and Poanka Hyundai on Route 1 in Fredericksburg, or better yet, log on to timpoankaforthepeople.com. And when we make a deal, I promise it'll be your lucky day. I'm Tim Poanka, and I'm a leprechaun for the people. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. With me, Washington, D.C., he is referred to as the mayor for life. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I posted on Facebook yesterday, <laughs> I, and, I, and I talked about a particular phenomenon. I think it was the day before. No, it was the day before. When um, I said, Mary and Barry will be on The Rock Newman Show on Saturday. By the way, today is Saturday, August the 23rd. Um, that Marion Barry would be on the show on Saturday, and I asked the question. I said, you know, Marion Barry, especially, especially if there is a black audience, there is not a public figure or politician that might walk into a room and receive the kind of love, have the kind of warm reception that Marion Barry receives. And I, gave it a, I made a case in point. There were, I would say, at the Washington Convention Center last May, before this May, um, uh, maybe 10, 11,000 people at Chuck Brown's funeral. And Mike Epps, the world-renowned comedian, was there, actor, uh, Donnie Simpson. There were other really big names that had come to pay tribute to Chuck Brown. And they all walked in. and. They, some of them might have got, been acknowledged and gotten a, you know, a, 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 a tepid applause. Marion Barry came in and the room erupted. 11,000 11, people really showing you a lot of affection. As I said earlier, you have had your ups and downs, your trials and tribulations. And, but there is, you, there is still a connection with the body of people here that I think in times in the future, people are going to try to study and examine <laughs> what that, and I said, what's his magic? So let me ask Marion Barry, what's your magic, man, well, that when you walk into a room and <laughs> People who've been just kind of sitting down, not paying attention to other high-profile people, you walk into a room and it's like you're a rock star. Well, first of all, Chuck, Chuck and I were very good friends. Okay. We eat together sometime. I go to some of his shows. Uh, and that particular instance, I didn't know how many people were in there because I just went in. And when I hit the door, I mean, I couldn't get up to the stage. <laughs> and I appreciate that. And I'm honored by that. Right. Uh, and then I made some relevant, I watched everybody, great everybody, talk about the music. Right. I said, I want to talk about the man, the right. man I knew, mm -hmm. the man that people knew. Mm -hmm. So I talked about him. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of it has to do with my strong belief in God. God permeated my life. But he gave me some gifts. He gave me gifts of affection for people, love for people, particularly low-income people, underdog people. Just like you, I, I fight for the underdog, so to make them an overdog in some instances. But I have genuine love for the people. I have a forgiving spirit. And in politics, that's unusual yeah. that you have a forgiving spirit yeah. of your political enemies. An uh, uh, interview call, uh, uh, a guy from the Washington Post called me. He was doing some kind of interview. And I remember one of the things that I told him, you know, uh, to Lord knows. You know, I would never be one to say I or Marion Barry or anyone else is without flaw and serious flaws. But one of the things I said about you when you talked about having a forgiving spirit, I said, Marion Barry has some childlike qualities <laughs> in the sense that 
he can't hold a grudge. I, I, I've never seen Mary Barrier hold a grudge. And I've looked at situations and been close enough to the situation to see where there was, you know, where there was betrayal. What I, what I thought was they had sort of le le no tri legitimate, legitimate betrayal yeah. and double cross, if you That's will. Right. And, Worst you know, a couple of days later, you are... It takes me about a month or two. To I mean, that. you know, I'm just saying, but, you know, that that, that, that that is one of the things that, that Marion Barry doesn't hold a grudge. Well, that, that goes back to my Christianity. Uh, I'm a Pentecostal Baptist. I, I go to Temple of Praise with Bishop Staples. And Reverend Wilson, before that, would give examples of Saul, who was a big tax collector and a murderer mm -hmm. in that era, mm -hmm. and got knocked off of the, junk, the donkeys and became Paul. Mm -hmm. And Paul. Let, let me just throw this in so yeah. people don't think I'm totally from on that road to Damascus. <laughs> yeah, on the road to Damascus. <laughs> and remember Wilson and other pastors who preach if God can forgive a murderer and give a tax collector that was unfair, why can't you forgive whoever messed with you? Right. It takes a lot of work, mm -hmm. a lot of prayer. I've mm -hmm. had to pray hard on some people. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not quite 100% there yet, but I'm putting my... The other thing, Rock, I realized that in life, if you're doing anything, or if you're not doing anything, you're going to get knocked down, push yourself down, mm -hmm. other people push you down. Mm -hmm. And the issue is not getting pushed down. We know we talked about this before. It's getting up. Right. That's true of boxing. Right. It's, it's getting up right. and saying, if you land on your back, look up. Right. If you look up, you can get up. Right. You can get up and go up. So that's, a, that's the kind of whole kind of spirit. But I've helped a lot of people, 100,000 young people, <coughs> getting some job. 100,000 in 16 years. Uh, people got houses through uh, HPAP. People got health care through other programs we put together. And so it's what you do that counts, not what you say. And so people in this town can point to things and point to this, point to that. We get the $128 million new blue in Ward 8. Because, high school. High school because yeah. of my big push. So when it gets ready, it'll be open in August of next year. People can point to that. Marion Brady. On my very own street, I moved to 1231 Tampa Street. And uh, my neighbor, after I got over there, said, Mr. Barrett, this street is awful. It's terrible. If you can't get it done, what they but us know people here and they So I got Tabber Street paved, new sidewalks, pavement. I got Dexter Terrace, got, uh, Tabber Terrace. I do that kind of stuff. Right. When I was on Orange Street, I'd be even set an example. One other thing, Rock, I was thinking about, we need more black men like yourself, like me, uh, who can set an example for black boys. 82%, 82% of the families in Ward 8 headed by female heads of household. Now, I give those, those women uh, a lot of accolades, but as you know, Effie and I had uh, one son, Christopher. It was tough raising him one son. We had all the resources. Right. Uh, we had the connection to get him out of boundary schools. Right. He went to uh, Merch, out of boundary. Went to Jefferson, out of boundary. Went to Wilson, out of boundary. What about those parents? that don't have that knowledge, don't have that connection, and don't have that support. We can buy crystal, you know, within reason, you know, computers and other kind of stuff. Yeah. And what about those who cannot afford to, to get a computer, can't get this, can't get technology, can't use Twitter, can't do this, and et cetera. And so I just fight for the people. Yeah. I fight for the people because I love them, and they in return love me. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of love going on. One <laughs> well, well, of the things back when back, um, Mark, Mark, Mark said this, when, that, when the city paper used to call me mayor for life, I didn't really like it then because I thought about Papa Doc in yeah. Haiti. Papa Doc Chevalier. Yeah, they'd be calling right. uh, president for life. Right. But the more I heard it, the more people talked about it, the more I liked it. So uh, <laughs> I had no problem. You know, let, let, let me go back. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask, I see the clock is ticking here. We only got about five or six more minutes. Uh, so I, I really wanted to get in a lot more. But let me go back. I'll to, come back, Rock. You well, know, well, I appreciate anytime that. Anytime you call me like you did this week. <laughs> I think you called me Wednesday or Tuesday or something like that. Marion, can you come with me? Show? I said, Rock, I got a schedule, man. You said, change it. Come down here. <laughs> 
Just me and you for a while. Uh, um, Anytime you call, Rock, you know. Here's what, what I want to ask about. Because you've been, seriously, you have been a good friend uh, over the years. Uh, even when you, you were the manager of uh, Riddick Bow, you invited Corey and myself to all the fights and all these other kind of things. And you've just been a p p person. I remember in, it was 94, I think, uh, when you helped bankroll my campaign uh, for mayor again. And you did it, and you, and you brought, what, what's your brother's name from New Orleans? Uh, uh, the Silas Lee. Silas Lee. Silas, Silas Lee, and, yeah. And poster and everything. Yeah, man, he's strong. So you have been there. Right. Uh, well, okay, well, I appreciate that. But here's what I want to ask about. Um, you've experienced something that not a lot of people have experienced, and that's actually being shot. Oh, yeah. You got shot <laughs> And live to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you got shot at one point. Take us back to that day. What were you doing? Where were you going? And how did you come about to get shot? It was March 1977. I just made a speech at the Corners Club on Connecticut Avenue. And you were on the city council then, school board? Uh, I was on the city council. Right. And... I came into the building. That time, we didn't have much security at all. Came right? into the district the building, district which building. is now the Wilson building. Wilson building right. Mm -hmm. And they had these crank elevators, you know, crank them, they go up to the fifth floor. Right. So I got on it. And I saw a friend of mine, a white guy, right across near the entry to the chamber. Mm -hmm. I started walking over there. Man, shots started ringing out. Hmm. And I got hit right up here. Well, you can, people can't see it, but right in my, in my chest, right in my heart. Yeah, no, they can see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's hmm. right. And God was uh, in the picture because they were using double out, double out buckshot. It must have been a ricochet shot. Hit me right here. And I went into the chambers. This one, I was wearing a vest and jacket. People were going to take that off. Somebody said, well, why don't you lie down? I said, I'm not lying down. I'm going to die. I'm going to sitting in this chair. Right. Right. I, was, I was scared I was going right. to die. I right. was afraid to breathe. I knew I had to breathe. Yeah. Because I remember Martin Luther King had had that stab in his chest. Right. And he talked about breathing. Right. And so some heroic uh, uh, cops waited until short. And sh I mean, it was, I'm telling you, right? It was glass shattering everywhere. I'm, right. I didn't know when they were going to come into the chamber. I didn't, know, right. I didn't know who how many they were there. And this was the, uh, yeah. the Hanafi, Hanafi Muslims, Muslims. At, yeah. at the time. They had, yeah. they had yeah. done something up at yeah. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's house up on 16th Street. Kids, right, man. killed the kids they up there. They were outraged. Right. The movie. So uh, a cop waited to, to, and a firefighter to shoot and die down the bit and put me on a stretcher, rushed me to the fourth floor and put me on the elevator and took me out. A rock, I tell you. That ride to the Washington Hospital Center was the longest ride like an eternity. I've ever had. Wow. I, I was driving at five miles an hour. Mm -hmm. I was anxious. Yeah. What, hurt? Did you feel hurt? Did you feel hot? What? I, well, I felt just a little hot, but not the kind of hot that you feel when it goes right through you. Yeah. Et cetera. My, right. My, my, mama, my mother was shot by my sister when she was, uh, my sister was nine years old. We lived in, in uh, Memphis. Who got shot? My sister. Uh huh. And my uncle bought an old pistol over there, and my sister, nine years old, playing with it, yeah. accidentally shot my mother in the back. Right. And she described it as like a hot iron hitting yeah. you. Right. So uh, I got to the uh, hospital center. A good friend of mine, Sam Mitchell, was a surgeon up there. So he operated on me in, in terms of taking the bullet out. Mm -hmm. And I was praying every minute. And I'm telling you, I never prayed so hard in my life. I said, God, please, if it's your will, let it be done with me because yeah. I don't want to leave here. Yeah. And God saved me mm -hmm. for a purpose. I tell people all the time, when they don't get involved with frivolity and, and crazy stuff, I said, God didn't put me on this, didn't save me from any being involved that kind of crazy stuff. He sent me here, involved me here, left me here so I could help people. I could be. I'm not his emissary, but I'm anointed by the Lord. And I have a mission in electing electoral politics 31 years and helping people in my, in my ministry. Uh, is there going to be a new stadium east of the river? No. Uh, gonna, the soccer stadium is going to be down in the southwest. Mm -hmm. But what the good news is, I put the uh, Reeves Center at 14th and U. 
There was nobody in my administration who supported it but me. And I said, how, how many support? How many I don't support it? How many support it? No hands went up. I said, ah. That would eyes have it. Mm -hmm. we'll put it the Reeves Center, which is right yeah, across yeah, the yeah. right across the street from this building yeah, right, right here. Right here. You right can see it. 14th and, and it has served its purpose. I put it there to be an anchor for economic development in this area. Mm -hmm. The one mistake I made was not making sure that black business people could stay there. Mm -hmm. I, I, think I, I think I could have done it if I had thought about it that way, because, you know, I increased black business from 3% to 47%. Right. And so... What time is it, Rock? Right? It's about time we, we, we actually, we're actually running up on the time where we got to work out. And I'm glad to hear you commit that you're going to come back again. I'm coming back. And anytime Rock Newman calls me, <laughs> like before, you know, it had Wayne Curry all over the time. Thank you, Rock. I love Aaron. you, brother. Okay, man. Thank I love you the people who watching. I right. love the people of the DNV. All right. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment with Phil Fornacki. To all my friends in the DMV, I am Rock Newman from the Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District of Maryland of Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor. here and no matter what the weather's like outside you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new pohanka hyundai in capitol heights during their giant markdown madness sale smart shoppers know that every new hyundai in pohanka comes with hyundai assurance and america's best 10-year 100,000 mile powertrain warranty but why don't you tell them about the markdown sale joe i'll be happy to kim folks shop around on the web and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 elantra gls at 179 dollars a month today at pohanka hyundai 99 a month that's right a 99 dollar payment on a brand new elantra 
Acura. And 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. This is the last hour. We're going to wrap up here. Today is August 2003rd. Uh, at, tab at the table with me now is Phil Fornisi. Um, Phil was a, uh, one of the authors of a report about uh, arrest in Washington, D.C., and the headlines are really glaring that a city, the nation's capital, which is now less than 50% uh, have a, less than a 50% African American population, that the number of overall arrests made between 2009 and 2011 was 83%, and the arrest uh, was 83% African Americans, and that the uh, drug-related arrests were 91%. African Americans. Um, there has been a response by Kathy Lanier, who is the uh, police chief in Washington, D.C., and frankly speaking, um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll get into that. Phil Good morning. Farnishi, welcome to the Rock Newman Thank Show. Thank you, sir. Tell us, um, what inspired you and your team to do this report? Well, we have been working for years with the D.C. Prisoners Project, working on behalf of prisoners in the system, people who are already incarcerated. And for us, it was really overwhelming that like 96% of our clients were African Americans. And we felt like we- When you say 96% were- Of people in the prison system. So 96% of the people in the DC prison system were African American. Yes. And at a time when the white community was starting certainly, you, you know, 2007, 2008, 2009 was certainly the population was growing significantly. So let me just ask this question. While 96% African Americans populated the jails, what was the racial breakdown at that point? In the city? In the city. Um, not that much different, probably 50, 50, 55, yeah, 55, a little bit more 45. than 50, 50 okay. yeah. Okay, so 55, let's say it might have been at let's that say point. say five years ago, yeah. Yeah, at that point, 55% Maybe yes. were African American, 96% African Americans populated the jail. Right. Okay. And what I think is important about that is when we talk about a prison population, you're generally talking about more serious offenses. Um, things for which people get sent to prison for a longer time rather than an arrest where you might get released. Right. Um, so we decided to look at the arrest figures and see what that resulted in, what that lo looked like. So we were able to get from the Metropolitan Police Department all of their arrests for three years, 2009 to 2011. Right. We also got D.C. Superior Court records, which they also generously provided really um, unredacted everything from Superior Court for the same three years. Mm -hmm. So we got real numbers. Um, yeah, wait, you're talking arrest. Let me ask a question. Did you determine what the racial makeup of the police department was? I, I do not. And I, I've been told different things. I don't have any solid information on that. But I agree that would be very useful to know. Mm -hmm. any, any, any guesstimate? I, I actually, I couldn't and venture and I tell you, you probably know better than I do. Okay. Um, so what we wanted to, to look at is sort of what happens on the street level because, and there's, and there's a couple things, it's, it's not surprising probably for anybody listening that African Americans get arrested a hell of a lot more than white people do in the city. You know that by walking to Superior Court, you know that by looking at the lockup, you know, just by life. You know that that's what happens in this in this city. And 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 to those that will say, African Americans get arrested more than anybody else in the other population because they commit more of the crimes. Well, that is often what they say. So that's why it's important to look at what they get arrested for, what we all get arrested for. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets really interesting. The D.C. police, well, and I should say, when I say the D.C. police, there's something like 35 police forces in this city. You know, there's right. the park police and right. all the rest. Right. Um, but we'll call it D.C. police for easy to talk about. Um, overwhelmingly, 
They arrest people for misdemeanors and for minor drug offenses. Um, only 4% of arrests, that's 4% of arrests are for what the FBI calls violent crimes. That's rape, murder, arson, sexual assault, those kinds of things. And that's the kind of thing you usually think you want the police to protect you from. Right. They don't, that's not what they arrest people for. They arrest people for overwhelmingly traffic offenses, almost 20% of the arrests. They arrest people for marijuana possession, 8 or 9% of all arrests are marijuana possession. Um, you know, other things, disorderly conduct. These are what people get arrested for. So I think it's important, it's not a question of who commits crimes. These are things that everybody practically in this city does. We have a city where something like 15% of the population smokes marijuana. Yet, um, of the people who get arrested, 93% are African American. Well, that certainly doesn't reflect the reality. Well, it does reflect the reality. Yeah. The, the question is, why? Right, I meant the reality of who's engaging in the conduct that could get them arrested. Right. Okay, so let's deal with that question. Okay. Let's deal with that question. 15% of the population indulges in smoking marijuana. That meant the total population. Right. And that's based on a government survey yeah. in the last yeah. couple of years. 91, 93% that get arrested for smoking marijuana are African American. African Americans make up less now than 50% of the population. So right. why is that happening? Well, that's a good question. Um, and what we've been doing is organizing a lot of community forums for people to come out and, and tell us why, what's happening, you know, what's the actual experience. And people are talking about a lot of things. They're talking about jump out squads. They're talking about walking down the street and getting harassed. And a police officer sticking their hand in their pocket and finding something. Or people getting scared into admitting that they have um, marijuana. The, the main point is, I think, that most of these arrests happen east of the river and at least in the eastern half of the city, the more African-American parts of the city. So, the so, so does your report point to discrimination within the police department and the way, and, the way that individuals are being arrested and who's being arrested? All, all we've really done is shown the analysis of this is what the reality is, this is what happens, this is what the numbers look like. Because what we wanted to do is that people, you, you have this feeling, you, you think this is what's happening, and we wanted to actually kind of quantify it so people could have something to hold on to, say really this is what you are doing. So all we've sort of shown is, is the percentage of arrests and how this all happens. There's a lot more information to be gotten and we wanted to start a broader dialogue and a broader you know, issue about what the police do and why they do it. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't answer all those questions. You know, it makes me think right now, uh, you know, as I'm, as I'm hearing you talk, obviously in wards seven and eight and four and five, there are predominantly, that's where the, the largest part of the African American population reside. Now, who resides in Jack Evans Ward, which is Ward 1, uh, Ward 2, uh, Jim Graham is here, Ward 1, um, Mary Shea is up in Ward 3. Now, you have in those wards, is Catholic University, is, is, is Catholic University Ward 4, do you know? Or five, I'm not sure. Okay, all right. But the, my point here is, is you've got American University, you have Georgetown University, and you know that the college population in those areas, I mean, who smokes pot? Right. College kids smoke a whole lot of pot. Mm -hmm. So do you have any breakdown in terms of neighborhoods or wards or regions you know, it would, for example, my thinking would be that young students attending those colleges would, you know, again, this is no scientific, but it's just a feel in a sense that they smoke pot and they would probably smoke pot on the same level as somebody in, in, in Ward 8 or Ward 7. The same, the same amount of people, if not more, they got more access to disposable income. So how does that break down? Um, well, you're right in terms of the arrests. It's very few, um, relatively speaking, hardly anyone gets arrested in Ward 3 on drug charges. Um, that's our, the, most, the whitest ward in the district. 
Um, wards one and two is somewhat more, but far less than seven and eight. So one and two is um, more more mixed and more white mm -hmm. um, than than seven and eight. So yeah, that is what happened. And what's interesting about Ward Three, the mostly white ward, is that people who do get arrested, particularly for marijuana, there are almost all African American. In Ward Three. So those who get arrested there, right, um, are the African Americans who venture to Ward Three um, and get arrested. So it's uh, it's a, it's an interesting situation. So matter basically throughout the city, the majority of the arrests. Okay. Are African American. Okay, now, so the so 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 folks are getting arrested at that, which to me is, is frankly an alarming rate. There is, you know, there's something wrong with that. Uh, you know, someone that was a uh, a mentor of mine a long time ago, when you couldn't figure out quite what was going wrong, he would say somebody's hiding in the wood pile. He'd use a uh, a word that we won't use here over the air, but it's, it, somebody's hiding in the wood pile. You know, I'd really like to, you know, pull the wood up and find out what's in the wood pile here. There is, there's, there's something wrong with this picture. That is not at all to excuse those who need to take personal responsibility for breaking the law. But if we are establishing that the cross-section of the population is breaking the law. 15% of those, 15% of the population is using drugs. And 93% of those arrested are African Americans. Something's wrong with that picture. I agree. What's wrong with the picture? <laughs> well, clearly there's selective policing going on. Only some people are being... Search I and mean, what you find when drugs are illegal, when marijuana is illegal and other drugs are illegal, it not only means that you're vulnerable to get arrested if someone sees you smoking it, it means that the police can pull you over and search your car. They're not going to search your car for anything but drugs. If they weren't illegal, they wouldn't be able to stop your car and they wouldn't have an excuse to get the dogs out and search your car. So I think it, it, the whole sort of drug war, the whole drug push, gives people, give police an excuse, to, a way to target people. Which is what I wanted to get into as to whether or not this report would be evidence for decriminalizing marijuana usage. Well, I, I, there is, in fact, as you probably know, there's a bill before the council right now to decriminalize. And yeah, I, I think it certainly gives strong argument for that. You know, when we talk about marijuana in particular, um, that's around 9% of all arrests in the city. I mean, that's just absolutely outrageous that that's what the police are spending their time yeah, on. Yeah, spending the time and the resources, which is, again, you know, we, we, we really get into, and we could really get into an argument here about marijuana use and being arrested for it and cigarettes being legal. And the thought that, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm someone, I've never had a drink of alcohol, I've never used a drug in my life. And so I'm not condoning drug use. I'm just saying when you look at the picture, and 9% of all arrests in the city are for, are for people who are some way shape, form, or fashion, involved in marijuana. And you talk about the resources that are used to do that, the time, the detail, the dollars that are used to do that. And then the impact on those arrested once they have been arrested in terms of their ability to to, to get a job after having an arrest record, their ability to get in school and that sort of thing. I think there is absolutely a growing body of evidence that s would suggest that we take a, not just take a hard look at this war on drugs, but that we have some sweeping overhaul of the policy. I, I would strongly agree with that. And it, it serves no purpose. And I think what we have to look at is why are people being arrested? Um, and so once you know the who they're being arrested, then you can think about why they're being arrested. And I think that it's really harassment of, of the segment of the population. And in this city, it's primarily younger African-American men who are being harassed and be targeted for arrest um, by the various police forces. 
And as you say, that has, one interesting thing about the marijuana arrests, I, I mentioned that we had information from Superior Court. Most of those charges are either dropped or they be, someone gets probation or very light. Nobody goes to prison for that, generally speaking. So the arrest happens and then it goes away. Yeah. But it doesn't go away if it's you. For one, you've had a traumatic experience of the violence of being taken to jail and held in a cell block and, and the, the terrible things that happened through that. But also, as you say, your ability to get a job, to get housing is affected, to get a student loan is affected. And you shouldn't take, make that decision to arrest somebody based on the color of their skin without any notion of, of danger or safety of the community. And of thing. course, the police department would say, we never arrest anybody based on the color of their skin. Of course and this, res this report says that's a damn lie. I, I think it says it's pretty hard to, to buy that. Yeah, I agree with you, yes. I, I don't see how it could be anything else. Um, when we come back, I want to talk about Kathy Lanier, who, uh, the, the, the chief of police in Washington, D.C., who by and large, you know, my observation and others, is, has been a fairly effective police chief on the surface. This statistic here is the kind of thing that starts to punch some holes in what appears to be that effectiveness. We'll talk about it in a moment when we come back on The Rock Newman Show at Bus Boys and Poets. Hello to all my friends in the DMV. I am Rock Newman from the Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District, Maryland or Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor. <laughs> Everybody, I'm Rock Newman from The Rock Newman Show, and I am absolutely flattered to have as one of my fine advertisers the DMV's greatest corporate citizen. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Pohanka Automotive Group. If you have any automotive needs whatsoever, if you want to sell your car, buy a car, trade in your car, have your car serviced, whatever you need, see my good friends at the Pohanka Automotive Group you will be well taken care of, I promise. I'm Rock Newman, I might be there. Come on down and see our good friends at Pohanka Automotive Group. And now, The Rock Newman Show. 
Welcome back, folks. Uh, this is the Rock Newman Show. I have uh, Phil Fernisi uh, here with me. We're talking about the report that was just released um, by, the, uh, by, by a legal group here in the area. Um, Phil, at one point, directed the D.C. prison project. Yes, sir. Um, um, before we go back there, let me tell you that busboys and poets will host a discussion on race the first Saturday of every month. It is called a continuing talk on race, ACTOR, A-C-E-T-O-R, a continuing talk on race. It will be tomorrow at 5 o'clock. The ACTOR series will be screening The House I Live In. That is a documentary film about the war on drugs and the racial disparities that th that, that war creates. Again, tomorrow, 5 o'clock, right here, 14th and V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C., the Langston Hughes Room. Uh, don't miss it. That'll be a very, very interesting film, The House I Live In, a documentary film about the war on drugs and the racial disparities that war creates. Phil Fernisi, uh, speaking about disparities, let's talk about it's Let's talk about traffic stops. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good issue. We, we often talk about race, or about drug arrests because okay. everybody talks about it and it's really glaring. But traffic stops, uh, traffic arrests are the most common arrests in D.C. Almost 20% of all arrests involve uh, Almost 20% of all arrests. Okay, now let's, say, let's, let's just let's walk through this. Okay. Almost 20% of all arrests in D.C. are traffic arrests. Right. Okay. With the population of African Americans being less than any other group, now in other words, the, the, oh, the population 50. the population now is a little less than a little less than fifty percent African American. Mm -hmm. The traffic arrests make up twenty percent of all arrests in D.C. Exactly. Okay, what percentage of traffic stops and arrests are African American? It's uh, just arrests, and it's seventy percent. So 70% of arrests of involving traffic offenses are among African Americans. Okay, now, the idea would be, is certainly with the population, let's say it were 50-50, the sense is that the white community and other communities certainly have as many cars, driving as many cars if not more. If not more. And, and again, when you're talking about traffic arrests in the district, you also are talking about folks who come from the suburbs. Right. Come from Northern Virginia, come from Bethesda, and come from Potomac. Okay. So there is a, so it would be reasonable to think that there are more non-blacks driving on the streets of Washington, D.C. than there are blacks. That would probably be a logical guess, yes. Okay, all right. But 70% of all traffic arrests are of African Americans. Right. And it's, it's a really interesting when you kind of look at that even more closely. Because when you look at DUIs or driving under the influence charges, which is your drunk driving, sure. that is close to 50-50. Mm -hmm. It's roughly, roughly half African American and half white and or vice, you know, similar numbers. And it's pretty close to what you might expect based on the population because there you have an objective more or less standard. Right. They stop you, you're swerving or whatever. Right. But you find the arrest for thing driving um, with a suspended license or driving without a, a license, overwhelmingly African American arrests. So people say, "Well, they're when, you say, when you say overwhelming, do you have a number to attach to it?" Yes, um, it's a, it's about eighty percent of uh, driving without a permit, and about the same of operating after a, with a suspended license. You know something? When you say eighty percent. That's really disheartening. And I'm going to tell you why it's disheartening. Because how would you know that a driver's license was suspended or revoked before stopping the person? Absolutely. And that's the point. And so the question there is, why did that person get stopped? That's a very, that's a very disheartening statistic. 
It, it is. Um, and I think it's important to point out when we try to deal with this more broadly is that this is an area where other police agencies are also involved besides Metropolitan Police. So mm -hmm. Particularly the Park Police do a right. lot of arrests of traffic. Mm -hmm. so Park it, Police, Capitol Police around down around Capitol Hill. Right. right. So there's a lot of that happening. So it's not to finger strictly the Metropolitan Police. They certainly are majority white right. uh, organizations. The, the, the Park Police the the, the Cap capital capital police yes they certainly are and their mm -hmm. leadership is mm -hmm. um, and, and so right so there's a, there obviously people are being stopped for some reason um, and then so you don't know if someone has a suspended license as you say until after you've stopped them so you're stopping somebody for some kind of other reason a broken tail light the old uh, proverbial one um, or some other minor infraction and then oh well you're driving without a license. So clearly people are being stopped for some other basis and it appears to be racially motivated. So you guys have done the report. You ha you are, do you plan to put forth, we had a gentleman on earlier, he did a book called uh, uh, Notion, Potions and Notions. Um, I mean, do you have a potion for this? I mean, what, what's, how, how, you know, how do you deal with this? What, do you, what are some of the solutions to try to correct which, you know, I said earlier th that were glaring. They're more than glaring. This is, this is unfair, and one might start to make an argument that this is damn criminal itself. Well, I and I think that is an important point. When you, usually people start talking about public safety when you talk about the police, and the point that I wanted to make all through this is that public safety also includes the right to not be harassed and taken off the street and taken to jail for little or no reason. And that is also a public safety concern. And when people are concerned about their policing in their community, that's a big concern. Did you see Kathy Lanier's response? I did, yes. Would you speak to that? Well, yes. I mean, a lot so, of... I mean, tell us what she said. Well, she said a few things. Um, well, one is what I've already said is that the Metropolitan Police are not the only arresting authority, so fine, we won't just blame them. Right. Um, but I guess her primary point has been is that just because the statistics don't match the population, um, it's not necessarily meaningful. She says that, well, we don't talk about why don't we arrest more old people um, or why are more men arrested than women, even though it's half of the population, which I think is just meaningless kinds of responses. Right. The other thing that she talks about is that we need to have a broader dialogue about things like education and housing and job opportunities. And this has some dealing with why people get arrested. And I really feel like that is just really confusing the issue. That yes, people have, many people in the city live in crappy places and have a hard time getting housing. People don't have jobs and economic opportunity is really rough here, especially if you're African American. But on top of that, you're arresting them. So I don't believe it's a cause that you're unemployed that you get arrested. It's just another thing that you're burdened with. Right. You know, I, I read it. I, I, I read her response, and I sat it down. And <laughs> I went away from it. I did, you know, what I do. And I went back to it a couple of hours later. And, you know, I have been one to applaud her in some of her efforts in many of her efforts. But in that response to this report, I thought it was unmitigated gibberish. I mean, it just was not coherent. It did not address the report. And frankly speaking, it didn't make any sense. I am absolutely uh, going to reach out to her to ask her you know, to come on the show. And, and this will be something I, I want to talk about. You know one thing, man? When you do a report like this, Someone has to take it and then present it in a way to create some accountability. And to the extent that we can with this microphone and this table, we, uh, we intend to do that. Now, what about you guys and what you're doing? Is that a function of what you will do also? Uh, partially. What, what my personal motivation in all of this has been is to get the information out and I, I do want to remind people that the report is available to them if they go to washlaw.org w-a-s-h-l-a-w dot org you can read the report and also there's a really handy map an interactive map of dc which is really very helpful to kind of explain things so i'd encourage people to look at it 
all this information I want it to be out there. I want people to understand it. I want it to get in their heads and to absorb it. Um, so as a part of that, what we'll be doing is sponsoring town forums and town hall meetings across the city and presenting this information and then have people fill out, well, tell us, what's your experience? Well, let me, let me say this. You know, you take this kind of report, and we talk about this here, and you have an audience of, 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 of African Americans, let's say, for example. They will hear this and really not be surprised. One of the responses I got through social media when I said that you were coming on and I gave the statistics of the reports that you had found Several responses came back to me and said, well, hey, well, tell me something I don't know. Now, that's, that, that's, from, the, that's from the African American community. They're like, yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, this is, what, this is what we're experiencing. What do you, when you talk to your white friends mm -hmm. about this, what kind of reaction do you get? I think people are surprised. I think it's not a surprise, generally speaking, who gets arrested. But the dramatic numbers are just really shocking. And I would say that even to African Americans who I don't, I realize that this is your daily experience that people see this, but to know the scope of it, the scale of what's happening, and what that biggest picture looks like, I still think that's very important to have that validated and have it understood. But I think most people are shocked by the numbers. What do you, what do you guys anticipate? How do you guys anticipate that the Metropolitan Police Force is going to react, and we really do have to include, when, when, when we talk about that, you know, those other agencies, Park Police, Capitol Police, Secret Service, and others, um, you, are you anticipating, you know, what they might do to try to, because this needs to be rectified. Well, clearly what is going on, uh, we have to get to the point of admitting what's going on. Right. And we're not there yet. The right. police are not admitting that. In New York, where the similar situation has is is been happening, they've at least admitted, yes, this is what we're doing. We stop and arrest people for minor offenses because of the theory is that it prevents more serious crimes. I don't think that's a valid theory at all. But they at least we can argue about that. Right. We're not even there yet. Yeah. So I, the D.C. police, the Metropolitan Police, have to admit that that is, in fact, what they're doing, and they're saying the opposite. They say they don't operate like in New York. We don't operate, we don't arrest people for minor offenses, and the point is, no, you actually do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and, and here's the evidence. Exactly. So I think that's one point, is let's all get on the same page about what you're all doing here. And then there needs to be a real p political response. I mean, you know, a lot of people want to say, well, you know, talk to your council member or do move on that. I don't think that the council or any politician will do a thing until forced to do it. This stuff happens for a reason. The, you know, Metropolitan Police didn't decide on their own to arrest people this way. You know, they're, they're, they're not the highest authority in the city. And we have to have a broader political discussion about what is happening around race in the city, in terms of gentrification in the city. You know, it's a lot of issues are bound up here. Well, hold on. You said that the police department uh, didn't decide to do that on their own. Mm -hmm. What are you suggesting? Who are you suggesting might have had influence in that process? I think where police resources are deployed, where they decide to put police, and you can see in the patterns of the way that population has moved out of this city. The city's getting whiter, um, and police resources are concentrated in African-American areas. I think you can make a pretty good argument that that reason that is happening it is, is to further gentrify the city. In, in an intentional... In, in an intentional manner. Yes. So in other words, police departments are being deployed in what are still primarily black sections, trying to force those black folks who are in the city out. Is that your? That, that's strictly my opinion, but yeah, that's what it looks like to me. That's a pretty, that's a pretty strong claim. Well, I, I don't know how else to talk about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, because when we see what's happening in the city over the last 10, 20, 30 years, I lived here 30 years, um, and you see what's, what's changing, and you see the way the police are deployed, I think it makes sense. Do you, are you suggesting that you think that perhaps, you know, the, that this has an, that, that, there's, that there are economic interests involved oh. here? Oh, absolutely, yes. Me, me, ex explain. I, well, I mean, uh, there's certainly economic interest in everything that happens in this city and around this country. 
um, you know, the, the way that the city received development happening all over the place um, and very high-end expensive development, there's less room for people who don't fit in for that. People who can't buy $600,000 condominiums, I can't, but, um, but other people, more people of color can't either. And there's less and less room for them in the city. And, and as people try to react to that or they try to maintain, they try to stay here, I think that's where the role of the police comes in. So you, again, your suggestion would be that there is de there are definitely economic interest and also you cannot look at these statistics and not think that there is a serious racial bias discrimination component to what's going on that ultimately yield these statistics. Yes. This is the nation's capital, and it's sad that that is happening and that this report reflects the behavior of folks in the nation's capital. Phil Frenisi, thank you so much for coming thank on the Rock News Show. We'll be back in just a moment, and we'll talk about the Tamadashi Exchange, Student Exchange Program. Uh, stay with us. Uh, we'll be right back in a moment. friends in the DMV. I am Rock Newman from the Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District Maryland of Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor. This is Leprechaun Tim Pohanka from Pohanka Nissan and Pohanka Hyundai. It's hard to be down on your luck when you're Virginia's first choice for new Nissan and Hyundais, but I need to sell 60 cars this week. Right now, I'll pay you big bucks for your good luck. Bring down any good luck charm you've gotten based on the sale price of the car you choose. I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car this week. Today, your lucky penny is worth plenty, up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car you want. Stop moping and hoping you'll get approved. 
With my For the People credit approval process, the banks are looking to get lucky and lend to you, even if you've been turned down before. Bring me any good luck charm and I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer newer car today. Hurry, once I get rid of 60 cars, the luck runs out. All offers require bank approval, so call us at 1-800-POANCA, visit Poanca Nissan and Poanca Hyundai on Route 1 in Fredericksburg, or better yet, log on to timpoancaforthepeople.com. And when we make a deal, I promise it'll be your lucky day. I'm Tim Poanca, and I'm a leprechaun for the people. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back. We have 20 minutes left on the program today, and I really wish we had two hours because I've got kids in here. And part of what The Rock Newman Show is doing is we are finding the good and celebrating it. And we got some good for you here today, and I think that's good. Um, I have in studio Sally Schwartz, founder and executive director, D.C., Center for Global Education and Leadership. She is accompanied by two District of Columbia and Japan exchange students. It is called the Tamadashi Student Exchange Program. Now, Tamadashi means friend, and we are here in friendship. So let me ask, before I go to Sally Schwartz, let me ask Sugaru. Sugaru is our Japanese guest today. If I said wow wow gao ichiba, does that does that does that ring a bell? Wow wow gao ichiba. Wow wow gao ichiba. Not really. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> the reason why I say that is yeah. because when I was in the sports world, we did the deal with a TV station in Japan, and they had us say wow wow gao ichiba and told us that meant you're number one. Now, they might have been saying, oh. ha having me to say, I don't want as much money as you're trying to pay us. <laughs> I don't know. That's why I wanted to ask you. Uh, yeah. So does, yeah. Does, yes. is, is Ichiban number one? Ichiban, yes. Ichiban, Ichiban, number, one. Ichiban number one. Okay, so yeah. something was number one, mm -hmm. but they told us to say, wow, wow, gao. Well, <laughs> it's probably ware ware gao. Uh, that's uh, the TV network? Oh, no, wait. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, okay. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Susan Schwartz, tell us about the Tommy Dashi Student Exchange. Um, I said Susan Swan. Sally Swan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, it's the uh, Tomodachi U.S. Japan Youth Exchange, and this is the first year of a very exciting, fully funded program, privately funded, that brings D.C. and Japanese students together on a two way exchange. So we're hosting Japanese students here, six for three weeks, and in November, our DC public school students get to go to Japan for now, three Now, when you weeks. say you're, you're hosting them here, who is hosting them? Where are they being hosted? Okay, well, that's an interesting question. We're hosting, programmatically, we have a program involving six DCPS students. DC public daytime. school students. DC uh -huh. public school students. Uh -huh. um, in the evenings, the six students are staying with different host families, um, so they actually get 12 different American experiences while they're here. So they're staying with host families, and they're also in the daytime hanging with DC kids. Uh-huh. Let me go to Rebecca Armstrong. Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. Thank you. To all of you, welcome. Shake my hand, huh? <laughs> there you go. And Sugaru thank and you. Sally, thank you also. But Rebecca, you've had now a couple of weeks exchange with the Japanese students. What have you learned? Um, well, I've learned about a lot of differences in the cultures, but as well as similarities between how we live and kind of how the teenagers are almost the same as us, uh -huh. um, American teenagers. Um, but I've also learned about different organizations in DC, um, service projects that we've been doing over the past two weeks. Um, so not only experiencing Japanese culture, but looking more into American culture and different organizations. What have you found uh, fascinating, most interested about your Japanese uh, guests uh, and their culture? 
and their, and their behavior? Um, well, they're very curious, and everything that they see that isn't the same as in Japan, right. um, sort of like their expressions are kind of interesting when they see something new. Give, um, me, give me an example. Um, so on the first day, we did a bus tour around D.C., right. and they noticed how there's a lot of American flags um, out and about, right. and in Japan, they don't have as many Japanese flags mm -hmm. on, like, homes or on people's shirts. Yeah. So they'd be like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's sort of like... Sugaru, you saw all of these flags, you and, your, you and your friends from Japan. You saw all of these flags. What was your thought when you saw them? Um, well, I thought that uh, it shows the side of America, the open side, the patriotic side of America. And, um, well, I think... Well, I used to live here, but um, uh, I was here when um, the the terrorist attacks on World Trade Center, 9 11, 9 11. Uh -huh. and um, I felt that it was after that th that those flags, you know, uh -huh. everyone started to put now, flags. Now, let me let, let me ask. So there was some surprise, almost shock, to see as many flags as there were. You know, you and your uh, your folks that were here from Japan with you. Mm -hmm. So there are much, there's much less of a patriotic or militaristic display in Japan? Yeah, um, it's kind of a hard problem in Japan because uh, um, if you would put up a flag, the, the national flag, in front of your house, you would be taken as a conservative, rather conservative, um, conservative mm -hmm. uh, character so mm -hmm. so 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 there is there so then the, the, there is the sense then that that sort of flag waving militarism is something more where you're being more aggressive in the thought of war or that sort of thing there's a <clears throat> there's something about that in sort of the mindset yes I think so that 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 is not peaceful y yes so mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't happen daily. It's mm -hmm. it's only in we only put up flags in a, a special events and a yeah. special occasion. Yeah. If I might personally opine, which perhaps I shouldn't do, but this is my show, so I'll do it. I like that a lot better. Uh, Albert Einstein said, "Patriotism is an is an is an infantile disease," and I think that there's so much to be said for you know, embracing all that is good and not necessarily such flag-waving and patriotism. Because when you start talking about that, ultimately what you're doing is you're setting yourself apart from someone else, you know. And so that's a, that's a very interesting observation. Please tell me, uh, Sugaru, um, what, has, what have you found interesting and fascinating about... Um, about Miss Armstrong here and the Washington D.C. public school kids. Um. Well, they have a very different mindset than um, Japanese high schoolers would have. And e explain. Well, um, <coughs> first of all, they're very open-minded, and um, they can. They, they're very generous to our, um, uh, our, the, I'm sorry, um, our reactions we have towards their lifestyle. Okay, okay. And, um, well, I feel that's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. And, um. Now, let me ask you this. When you say they are open, you find the D.C. public school kids to be, to be open. Mm -hmm. Is that to say that you feel as if you and the kids that come here from Japan don't quite say, have that same sense of natural openness? Well, the biggest difference between Japan and America is, because, um, is that there's not much diversity in Japan. And, um, well, D.C., I found, is a very diverse uh, city right. in terms of uh, the diversity in culture and also diversity in the class. So... Um, I think that the D.C. kids, they've grown up here uh -huh. um, in, inside this well, you know, whole bowl of different people. Right. And I think that's what makes them so. And you guys basically have not. 
because well, not there's really. not getting it's, not been nearly you know the sense of diversity anywhere across the board mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right what's been your favorite food um i, I really like chipotle it's not really american food <laughs> but i really liked it yeah yeah and what about the rest of your uh the the, the kids that come any, any anything stand out in particular uh for them yeah um yeah, they like the food because they can come in like big quantities. There's one guy who really eats a lot, and he, he just <laughs> loves it. We we all think he's American. Yeah. <laughs> As it is to say, that typically you view the Ameri the American diet as being much more abundant. That people eat a lot more. People eat a lot more here. Uh -huh. They come in, yeah, bigger quantities. And it's interesting because um, <clears throat> uh, you're not supposed to leave. Food, uh, you're not supposed to um, uh, throw out leave food mm -hmm. in the Japanese culture. You're supposed right. to eat everything that's served. Right. And, you know, um, well, we've seen a lot, a lot of uh, times when people leave food. Uh -huh. Leftovers. Right. They, they would right. leave leftovers. Th and that, this, was that really like a surprise to Yeah, you? that was a surprise for us. Really? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Um, Hip-hop. Hip-hop. Yeah, I love it. Hip-hop. Go-go. Go. You seen, have you seen or experienced any go-go, -go, which is an indigenous music, to Washington, D.C.? Um, <laughs> I don't think we've uh -huh. actually, like, showed them go-go. Uh-huh. But we show them different, like, songs and, like, popular artists like Chris Brown or, uh -huh. um, I don't know, any other artists. Did I hear that, did I hear that uh, you guys, somebody was trying to scratch? Oh, yeah, we did DJing mm -hmm. um, at... Words beats in my, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> my shirt. Um, so, yeah, he did a lot of scratching. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. Uh, t t tell me about that. Well, uh, so well, Words Beats in Life has different classes. And um, when we went, we chose from the graffiti class, the break dancing class, and the DJ class. And I'm all into that, you know, uh, music. Break so. dancing? Oh, no, the music. So I went uh, for the... So you, you're not too good on the break? Because <laughs> no, I was about to invite dance. you to get up on this table. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So tell me, um, what will you say to your friends after this experience? They were like, oh, you had, you, you know, you hung out with these Japanese kids for a couple of weeks during the summer. Mm -hmm. What will you say to your friends about this experience? Um, I don't really know. I think I'll kind of tell them all those different stories and different things that I've learned from them. Um, probably just tell them how cool they were. Uh -huh. um, what do you think you've learned? From, from, from the guests that came in? Um, I've learned to really look at American culture and kind of look at how I live um, my daily life. Because mm -hmm. I think we sort of take things for granted. Like, um, we're so friendly, as they say. Uh -huh. Like, um, at customers, when they're buying things, you know, the cashier will have a little conversation. But they don't see that as much. And I think Americans, we kind of bypass a little bit. We don't think about how friendly we are. Um, I don't know. It's just been a really fun experience. Let me ask you, Suguru. Did it's been predominantly African-American kids that you've inter interacted with since you've been here, right? Okay. Now, when you go back to Japan and you talk to your family and friends and tell them that you hung out with African-American kids, what will they be surprised about that you'll say to them? That's a really hard question. Um, well, my parents uh, have experience abroad, so um, well, I'll I'll probably tell them a lot about uh, the li lifestyle I have um, at my homestay, uh, the my homestay house, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I think they'll be surprised at um, just the lifestyle. I mean, all the all the every little details, of life they'll find different. Do you feel as if? The Japanese community and the people, your family, your friends, that view the African-American community, the black community in the United States, do you feel as if they primarily view that community through the lens of what they see on videos? Yes, oh. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they mm -hmm. will. Because most of them, they've never spoken to an African American person, right? That's yeah. Right. So they don't really know what kind of people they are, right? Only right. only the people on TV yeah. shows. And, and you know, I, I I will say this that unfortunately, that too many of the videos, the hip hop, 
the gangster rap and all the rest, depict African American life in a very unflattering form. And if that's the lens that you're looking at a community through, that's how you develop your thoughts about that community. Mm -hmm. So I would just suggest that it really becomes important for somebody like yourself who has come here and had this experience to go back into what little bit of impact you can have is to try to say basically, because what a part of what I think I'm hearing you say is we really are very similar. You know, part of the, the tagline for the Rock Newman Show here is we are one. And I think that that kind of inter interaction that you guys are having through the Tamadashi student exchange experience, it allows you to really understand that message and not be so myopic in the view, in your view of how you view a culture and a population of people. Um, there is such incredible danger in the culture being promulgated just through those videos. That I, find, I, I frankly think that's unfortunate. And having a discussion with you, if you like this, to, to understand, to, to just validate that that is how a large population of people see a community through just those videos. Sally, what was the inspiration for this? I, it's, I think it's a fabulous idea. Congratulations to you and all of those that made this happen. What was the inspiration and what did you want to accomplish? Um, well, what I wanted to accomplish, I'll say there are many people involved in this, but um, this, there are a lot of exchanges that go on between the United States and other countries. Um, the work that I do is focused on our young people in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. And it's ironic, we've talked about ironies and contradictions in Washington, D.C. And one of the ironies is that we're in this really international city and our local students have so little exposure to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So um, we were really happy to be invited to have D.C. students involved in a U.S.-Japan exchange. They mm -hmm. could have picked any other city, right. but we picked our kids to yeah. participate. Yeah. So I think the Japanese students learned a lot from being here with our students and uh, broke down so many stereotypes. It's an ongoing process. But you know, when you bring kids together and you have food, yeah. a lot happens immediately. <laughs> so I, I think they hit it off really well and are just learning tons from each other. So Now, will the same kids that have been involved, that, that, that have been involved in this two weeks, will they be the kids that's going to Japan? Yes, they will, as so, long as they do everything they're supposed to do. <laughs> Rebecca, are you going to Japan? Yes. You going to do everything you're supposed to do? Yes, what, I am. What are you supposed to do? What, what, do you, what do you have to do in order to make sure that you, you know, fulfill, fulfill this dream of going to Japan now? Um, learn Japanese mm -hmm. probably is the first um, and then the second is working more on service project um, and focusing on what we're going to do to help change DC okay one of the things that you want to come out of this is for there to be collective thought for a service project as to how you might positively positively impact the ravaged the tsunami ravaged area of Japan, have you guys talked about that at all? You've got any, got any, any, any thoughts? Anybody having any ideas about you know what you might suggest or what you might do in that area? Um, no, we haven't really fully talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, I know the DC students just know we're going to go do service projects and help with the relief right. in the area. Right. But that's about it that we know. So you nervous? Um, no, not really. I'm excited. Re re excited. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, so you guys leave on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. You leave D.C. on Tuesday. DC on so is there like one thing here left in D.C. you want to make sure you do before you leave? Um, I really want to go to the building museum. That's one place I really want to go. Why? Because, uh, well, I like architecture and it's the only museum I, uh, museum I want to go to that I haven't gone yet. What's so been your favorite experience? The, the time you've been here, what has been your favorite experience? I really like the Natural History Museum. I've been there before, but I don't really remember it. But I went there, and it was, it was just great. I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so do you feel as if this experience has opened your eyes and sort of broadened you know, the way you think about the world? 
Yes, definitely, yes. Uh -huh. Well, that's a very good thing that this experience did just that. Hopefully, that's what we can do a little bit here from this table is the same thing, is to open up the world and to help change the world one day at a time. It is the mission of this particular restaurant. I think you guys met the owner and the visionary, Andy Shalal, and he is a social entrepreneur. Hopefully, you guys learned a lot from him. Yeah, it was a great experience, and I hope your experience going to Japan is a wonderful one also. Thank you all so much for being on The Rock Newman Show. Folks, that's it for today. We are going to wrap up, and we're going to go, as my friend said, in peace and friendship. God bless. Thank you.